Now it's really recording. It's your, your yeah. turn, please. So welcome to this first session on the mini colloquium on high harmonic generation in solids. So the first speaker is Javier Garcia de Abajo, and he will talk about probing and generating high harmonics with electron beams. So please share your screen. And I will give you a hint after 25 minutes. So the idea is to talk for 30 minutes and have 10 minutes discussion, okay? Good. Okay. So here I'm sharing my screen. Yes. In presentation mode, I, I hope you can see it. Yes. All right, and you can see my pointer, no? I made it larger. Yes. So, Okay, I will um, uh, thank you very much for, for the invitation to speak here. Um, despite the circumstances, I think this is the, going to go very well, very exciting experience. So I'm going to talk about the uh, nonlinear response of different materials, harmonic generation in, uh, um, in, uh, in strongly nonlinear materials such as, uh, as graphene in particular, and also a little bit about uh, uh, how electron beams can, can help uh, probe that and excite that. Uh, non-linearity, right? So, let's see. So first of all, I would like to uh, uh, basically uh, uh, cover what are the, the ways in which you can um, uh, enhance the electromagnetic field that uh, when you want to interact with, uh, with nanostructures, so that uh, if you want to trigger non-linear response, it's good to have very high uh, 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 optical field. Uh, uh, for a given illumination intensity, you want to amplify it. One uh, way of doing that is through plasmons. Plasmons can be uh, in the material that is nonlinear or also in an external material, like for example here, uh, it's represented just, uh, just uh, a silver nanowire and the field uh, at the ends of nanowires is, is uh, known to be enhanced by many orders of magnitude, right? So um, uh, as much as, as uh, uh, maybe four, or this magnitude, so that also enhances the second harmonic, third harmonic, etc. Right? Another way of doing of enhancing the electromagnetic field with, uh, is through the use of, of uh, dielectric cavities. You can think of light confined inside a cavity where, where uh, it's totally confined, so the, the quality factor is huge. If you illuminate it, then the intensity goes up by the quality factor, essentially. And this is achieved, for example, in MIA cavities, uh, dielectric resonators, right? where again, the electromagnetic field can be enhanced by many orders uh, of magnitude, several orders of magnitude. And a third, and I think last way of enhancing the electromagnetic field is by engaging uh, resonances in periodic systems. It could also be quasi-periodic systems. And then uh, even if each of the elements in this uh, uh, periodic arrays is uh, responding very weakly to the external light, the, the, there are certain resonances and, uh, related to the good anomalies that will enhance the automatic field also by orders of mind. Okay, so there are different ways in which you can uh, utilize resonances in order to trigger the nonlinear response and, and uh, harmonic generation. And the uh, uh, plasmon, for example, is is uh, is one of them that we have been exploiting a lot in the in the past. And uh, so I will present uh, uh, work that we have done over the last uh, few years. Actually, Joel Cox, who is now in the, in the session and, um, and will be speaking later, uh, has been pivotal in uh, this work. So it's, a lot of it is actually his work. So this uh, is uh, uh, representing a ribbon of graphene. Uh, graphene is a very strongly nonlinear material and it has plasmas. So you can enhance the nonlinear response because uh, of the plasmons, and at the same time, it's a very strong, a strong nonlinear material. The reason why it's very uh, strong nonlinear, you can see it for uh, the intra-band uh, dynamics of the, its uh, conduction electrons. You can see that the, the dispersion relation is strongly non-parabolic, and that means that that uh, the current that uh, is generated in response to to an external field. Is going to be is going to have this kind of, of, of shape with electrons just changing velocity and the current changing velocity uh, 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 for, for different parts of the optical cycle. And this is in contrast to um, uh, strongly up to parabolic um, uh, materials, uh, parabolic dispersion materials, for example, um, a semiconductor where with the, its uh, conduction band is slightly populated. And then you can see that the, because it's parabolic, so the electron uh, motion follows. Uh, follows uh, 
com completely the harmonic uh, motion of the external field with some delay maybe, uh, but then the response is totally linear and that there, is, there are no harmonics other than the fundamental harmonic, okay? This is emphasized in this work also with uh, 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 Andrea Marini, a former postdoc in my, in my group, where you can see the current that is generated um, in response to an external electromagnetic field as a function of the intensity is in this field. And initially, uh, everything is very linear. Eventually, the, the, the current, you can see that it pick up, picks up nonlinear uh, components, nonlinear components. So I'm going to talk a little bit about graphene, and so how we describe do we describe the the electromagnetic the um, uh, optical response of, of, of this material. So first of all, you have the electronic structure of the carbon atom, and then due to hybridization, uh, 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 then for, you have this sp bonding uh, orbitals, and uh, uh, and then you have also one orbital that is sticking out of the plane of uh, of the screen of your screen here. And now this, this orbital has uh, one electron per, per carbon atom, but two uh, is doubly degenerate, so, so it, al it al allows for, for two of them. So each atom has one of these uh, uh, 2p orbitals sticking out of the plane, and you can represent to a good approximation this material through a, a tie binding a model in which each atom is just uh, one side. Uh, as I said, it's a doubly uh, degenerate uh, uh, um, um, state because of a spin. And now this is just a tie binding, the result of a tie binding calculation where basically uh, you see it's a back of the envelope calculation that gives you this dispersion relation with um, uh, uh, near the Fermi level, there is nothing else other than uh, these uh, conical band structures. Uh, half of the, uh, of the states are populated, that's why the, the, the lower the Dirac cone is populated, the, the upper Dirac cone is totally unpopulated. Uh, in pristine graphene, and this happens to be at one of the singular points of the of the graphene, the uh, uh, first region zone. There are two of them uh, in each uh, region zone. So um, uh, let's see. So actually, this compares extremely well with uh, with um, 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 photo emission from uh, angle resolved photo emission, where you can see if the material is slightly doped, so you can see a population up to the, the conduction band and, and this uh, back of the envelope uh, uh, Iraq uh, calculation just uh, mimics very well what is observed in, in, in experiment. Okay, now in general we want to deal with uh, nanostructural graphene or just uh, plan uh, um, extended graphene. And then one way of doing that is by using the linear, the, uh, linear response theory, random phase approximation, in which the uh, tie binding uh, coefficients the, of the, for the, the wave functions, the eigenstates of the, of the system, so these coefficients, they enter this uh, RPA susceptibility uh, uh, through this uh, well-known formula. And then from here, you just get the, the linear response just by number crunching. And then you can uh, uh, um, work this out for up to uh, several thousand atoms or tens of thousands of at or atoms, and also for uh, linear structures like, uh, like graphene ribbons, for ribbons up to several tens of nanometers in, in, in width. And then uh, you can see here a comparison of, a quantum, uh, of, of, of these uh, calculations, these random phase approximation calculations, for ribbons that have, um, like this one is a zigzag termination, or armchair termination, so it's the other way around, or also classical theory. So classical just meaning uh, a completely classical do the model for the, for the, uh, to represent the response of the optic of the uh, conduction band. And so uh, what you see is uh, uh, this uh, interesting result, which is if the, the, you see a plasma, first of all, uh, for, for this precision of the, of the electric field. So you see a plasma and all of the model coincides uh, relatively well, if this uh, plasmon has energy, for example here, 1.2 EV, lower than the Fermi energy of the material. So also, also here, it's lower. But if it is larger than the, than the Fermi energy, so 0.4 here, then the, the, the three models are completely different. And this is because basically uh, there are uh, quantum mechanical effects uh, into the, the plane error in the response of the material. And essentially, for example, for the zigzag, you have edge states uh, at zero energy that will completely dump the, the plasma. And that's what an effect that you see here, okay? This is a calculation by Joel Cox in which you can see similar, a similar 
uh, um, uh, discussion in the case of, uh, of uh, nano triangles of, of graphene with uh, uh, arm term terminated, so no edge states. And then you can see the classical, fully classical calculation gives you something smooth for the, for the plasmos. Eventually, when you consider uh, a triangle with the same size, uh, described this uh, uh, random phase approximation, you see uh, similar plasmon plus some other features here associated with uh, electron hole per excitations. As the triangles become smaller and smaller, you, the, the physics is the same. So you still have something like a plasmon and something like electron hole per excitations. Eventually, this becomes discretized because of the finite size of the structure. And this works all the way down to a single molecule, this triphenylene uh, molecule, right? So, so it's remarkable that this is essentially the same, the same uh, model giving you this, all these cases. So uh, uh, if you want to uh, uh, account for nonlinear effects, you have to do a little bit better than, than linear response theory. And so what we do is uh, we have the, the density matrix, the one particle density matrix of the, of the system, now uh, expressed in this uh, site basis uh, set. Uh, so the, this is the equation of motion for the density matrix in which you can introduce uh, a dumping, so a finite lifetime for, for the excitation. And so you have a Hamiltonian that consists of the tie binding part of the Hamiltonian. And now you have a driving uh, potential which is the external field, externally applied electric field, and some induced field. So in the induced field, you, you have uh, 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 essentially the, the density matrix entering back again. So you have uh, a nonlinear loop, yes? So you have in the Hamiltonian, you have density matrix, and also the density matrix here. So these terms is quadratic in the density matrix. And that's why you have uh, nonlinear. Non so uh, through uh, calculations with this model, you see that the, the graph, graphene is actually responding very nonlinearly. And for example, for second harmonic and third harmonic generation, uh, the level of nonlinearity for, for islands uh, of different size, uh, uh, shown here, is actually orders of magnitude higher than what is uh, uh, observed for silver or gold nanoparticles, which are among the most uh, nonlinear uh, uh, materials you can, you can think of in this, in this uh, range. So uh, high harmonic generation, you can play the same, um, the same calculations and then uh, try to look at the at different harmonics how they are emitted. And this is uh, uh, for one of the first calculations we did uh, back in, in, in 2014. So uh, you can see that, uh, for example, you have uh, this triangle illuminated with, uh, with uh, polarization along the Y direction so, so that's uh, essentially uh, vertical direction here. Then you excite uh, all harmonics with X polarization in, in, or horizontal there. You only oxide, excite the, the uh, odd harmonics because of the inversion symmetry of the system. But the, the efficiency of excitation is actually very high. So, so uh, you can uh, uh, look into uh, the dependence of the emission uh, uh, intensity as a function of, of, uh, of uh, photon emission energy uh, and also as a function of incident energy. And you can see this, uh, each of these lines is, is a different harmonic, fundamental, second, third, etc. And you can see an enhancement, kind of an enhancement, uh, basically where the uh, uh, material has a plasma, so already right, driven here by the linear response, but it, this propagates uh, up to, to a higher uh, harmonics. Okay, so an alternative way of of, of looking into uh, in of si simulating this type of of, uh, of response is by uh, having a, a two-band model in which you just uh, uh, represent your graphene only by the linearized uh, uh, dispersion uh, relation. So you have this this uh, Dirac continuous Dirac uh, uh, fermions, and then uh, um, uh, this is the the uh, the momentum, and then so it and then the, the external oops, the external field enters here through the vector potential, which is this external field. So the vector potential is calculated here, and then uh, then you just expand this uh, this um, um, uh, uh, electron wave function for each uh, k point in in your in your first region zone. Uh, as uh, a function of the of the solutions, which are basically in the upper and lower cone, and just run calculations for the time the dynamics of the, the expansion coefficients. Okay, and if you do that, 
compare with the previous calculation, which is this complete tie binding, uh, it actually works uh, pretty well. So uh, the advantage of this uh, other method, the two-band method, is that it allows you to run calculations for much larger structures. In this case, for example, a 100 nanometer ribbon, so compared to, to this one. Okay, so this is just a, a, another uh, a comparison between the nonlinear the response of, uh, of this material with other materials that are also very nonlinear. So here you see calculations. Uh, uh, some of them are with this uh, tie binding, some of them are uh, with, with, uh, with uh, uh, this two band model. And then uh, systematically, you can see uh, very high uh, levels of, of nonlinearity for the different harmonics. So this, this is the, the third, fifth, seventh, etc. And then you have a comparison with some experiments here. So these experiments are taken from other uh, nonlinear materials which were at the time uh, high harmonic generation have been measured. And then the prediction is that for graphene, you, you reach a similar level of nonlinearity with much lower uh, peak intensity, okay? Or fluence or, or, or peak, is, peak intensity in your, in your external elimination, okay? This is another uh, effect that you observe because of the strong nonlinearity of this material. So basically, you have a saturable absorption. You can excite uh, electrons in the in the conduct in the valence band to the conduction band uh, for a given energy. There is uh, only one combination of this that you can you can uh, reach. And then, if the intensity uh, of the external light is uh, sufficiently large, then you you populate you you uh, eventually drive as many electrons up as, uh, as down, because then you saturate the, the, the absorption, right? There are no more electrons that can be promoted. And as a result of that, as a function of intensity, you have a certain uh, absorption cross-section. So this absorption cross-section actually uh, gets saturated. So when the intensity goes very large, then, uh, then the, the, the absorption is uh, reduced with respect to what's expected from the linear theory. We actually uh, investigated with this with Andrea uh, uh, Marini. So uh, what he did was to consider uh, this uh, graphene nanoflakes uh, embedded with uh, a gain medium, uh, in this case, uh, rhodamine uh, molecules. And so assuming you have uh, pumping, so the rhodamine has some inversion of population. And this is an, uh, a very strange uh, metamaterial that uh, is actually very uh, nonlinear. Uh, and has a lot of gain. As a result of that, then the combination of this attributable absorption and the gain, you just uh, 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 have the spontaneous uh, formation of, of lacing and uh, transition between uh, um, uh, regular lacing and chaotic uh, uh, light dynamics. So I refer to this paper if you are interested in that. So out of these studies, we applied uh, uh, this theory to an experiment run in uh, uh, Jens Bigger's, Bigger's group uh, in my institute at ICFO. So what he was doing was to uh, uh, send uh, very short pulses and then look at the um, intrapulse dynamics of the, of the uh, graphene, of the response of, of the graphene. Uh, so what, what happens during, during the, uh, this uh, short, short time, uh, during the, the lifetime of, the, of this uh, uh, optical pulse. So first, first of all, you have this, uh, this absorption of electrons, eventually they thermalized uh, and eventually they relaxed to, to how it was at the, uh, the beginning. Okay, an interesting effect that was observed was that uh, because of this intra-pulse intra, intra, uh, dynamics, so the response of the material is changing while the, the pulse is, uh, is uh, passing through it. And as a result of that, then you have uh, some uh, blue shifts of the spectra. So they move to, to a high energy of the harmonic uh, uh, peaks, the, the third and the fifth harmonic in this case, uh, uh, with respect to, to just the three times or five times the, the energy. Right? So uh, you also uh, uh, explain uh, through these models how uh, linear polarization, which uh, drives the electrons, the electrons in the medium close to the Dirac point, and then they follow this uh, uh, alternate uh, sign of the of the current. Uh, no matter where you start in the Dirac point, this, this effect tends to happen for high fields. And if you compare that with dynamics with uh, circular polarization, you can see here. Uh, it's, it's, it doesn't pass so much through the Dirac uh, point. So the nonlinearity 
uh, should be lower for circular polarization. And this is an effect that is actually observed uh, experimentally. Okay? This is a, a related work uh, in, in, in the group of Liang Wong in uh, Sing Singapore. So extending this, uh, this uh, model from 2D uh, Dirac material, like graphene, to a 3D Dirac material, in this case a semi-metal, you see similar phenomenology. So it's actually very strongly nonlinear material for the same reasons uh, I explained uh, before. And then actually there is, a, there is an interesting effect. You can have um, a certain threshold below which only third harmonic generation is produced and all of the rest of the harmonics are, are suppressed. But if you pass that threshold, boom, all of the harmonics are, are efficiently generated up to very high, high order. Okay, you can see the archive paper here is now submitted for publication. So as an application of this, of this um, um, uh, material, uh, what I have not mentioned is that uh, most of the things that you've seen in the previous slides, uh, all of these, no, they, they tend to occur in the, at very low frequencies in the mid-infrared. So energies of photon energies of 0 0.1, 0 0.2 eV, or uh, wavelengths of uh, several microns, right? And uh, so the appeal for technological applications is not that, that great in that, in that range. So there have been lots of efforts to move toward the uh, shorter wavelengths in the, in the infrared, in the near infrared and the visible where there are more applications, right? And there are different ways in which you can do that just by shrinking the, the size of the structure as you have seen uh, before in, in Joel's calculations. So when you go to this definitely in other plasmons, the, the, the response of the material has uh, these plasmons in the, in the visible regime. You can also do some tran transient uh, thermoplasmonics just by heating and creating incoherent nonlinearity. I will talk a little bit about that later. But you can also uh, uh, use this, uh, this uh, idea from Joel Cox that consists of uh, uh, exploiting the extreme nonlinearity of graphene uh, to transform a very uh, small energy photon, in this case, uh, uh, three photons will make up a third harmonic. But, so this is in the mid infrared, but now this is in the near infrared. So again, technologically not so important, technologically more relevant. And then uh, the in and out in this system, incoming photons, outgoing photons can be in the in the near infrared, but all of the internal dynamics happens in the mid infrared. So. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, he demonstrated in this paper that uh, this, is, this is practical. The coupling between, uh, for example, a quantum emitter and, and graphene is actually quite strong uh, through, through the, this, this nonlinear uh, uh, scheme. And uh, uh, well, uh, uh, he looked at different various effects, for example, uh, this electromagnetic induced uh, uh, transparency. Uh, so you, you come with a photon at certain energy, and because of the resonance through the, through the third harmonic, then you, you produce this uh, this transparency effect. No? Here, for example, is another quantum of Fermi energy. Okay, there is also this incoherent nonlinearity, uh, maybe less relevant for for harmonic generation, but I think it's interesting anyway. So when you heat uh, this material, graphene, uh, with, uh, with the light pulse, then you create electrons and holes. Eventually, they're thermalized, and they behave. You can see here that they, these, these uh, uh, electrons, for example, they, they have places to make transitions, whereas before, before creating them, the only electrons available were here, and these electrons are more difficult to make transitions, low energy transitions. So low energy transitions are what you need to drive uh, plasma dynamics. And actually, if you compare the optical response of this material by heating uh, at a very high temperature or by uh, doping a lot, but at zero temperature is actually a very similar response. Okay, as a result of that, then you have, for example, resonances in this in the system, plasmonic resonances in this system that can be driven actually by, uh, for example, in this case, by by dump, uh, uh, doping to a high level or by, by heating the material to a high uh, electron temperature, okay? So this uh, uh, type of, of physics has been explored uh, experimentally, for example, in this group, uh, in this paper by the Basov's uh, group, uh, where uh, he looked at these uh, fringes as a function of distance to a graphene flake uh, with, with a near-field uh, optical microscope and this 
these fringes basically reveal the presence of plasma. So this happens only soon after pumping. Uh, so you pump, elevate the temperature of the electrons, and you create these fringes. Uh, you wait enough, these fringes go away, simply because the temperature goes down, so no, no more plasmas are supported in the system. So again, Joel uh, 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 investigated this uh, scheme by which you can utilize this uh, elevation of the electron temperature and the change in the optical response to, uh, to make a switch, an optical switch for a single photon. So the idea is you start with, uh, with uh, uh, graphene nanostructure, you absorb the photon, the response changes, and eventually it thermalizes. And in this range, in this region, then the response will be different, as you can see here. Just by absorbing a single photon, the, the spectrum changes completely. So the next photon that will come will not be so much efficient in, in, in exciting this. this. So, Javi, you talked for 25 minutes now. Yeah, so okay, minutes. Well, I have four, five more minutes. For, for the talk and then 10 minutes discussion. Okay, I think I will, I will, uh, I will make it. So, good, thank you. So uh, we've been exploring this, this sort of uh, incoherent uh, nonlinear dynamics. Actually, the, systems, uh, the system becomes very nonlinear due to this, uh, this uh, regime. It, it also affects the harmonic generation in, in a detrimental way, I, I would say. It's also important how you describe the dynamics of the of electrons, and you can see details in, this, in these papers here. You know? And then the last uh, five minutes, I will talk about what I promised in my title. I was very uh, optimistic uh, when, I, when I wrote the abstract, thinking I was going to, to have enough material to talk about uh, a lot of new stuff with electron beams only for harmonic generation. But this is still in, in progress, so I will, I will talk only for five minutes about how these uh, electron beams can be uh, actually used to generate harmonics or to probe harmonics, etc. No? And then I have to uh, change gears a little bit. Now, in electron microscopy, now it is possible to send a single electron and make it interact with a nanostructure at the same time as an optical pulse. You say an electron pulse and, a, and, a, and an optical pulse, both of them coincide in time and space. As a result of that, then you have uh, the electron uh, gaining energy or losing energy, right, from the photon field. So this has been explored. This was a technique initiated by the late Ahmed Seville. And then you can see here an uh, electron uh, energy loss spectrum. So these are energy losses, this part, but the left part of the spectrum is, is just gains. So an electron can lose energy because it produces photons, or it can gain energy because it gains photon energy. Okay? Uh, this technique is known as a PINE, photon-induced near, near field electron microscopy. Uh, uh, we contributed to explain it, and uh, also we predicted some oscillation uh, this, these are the number of electrons, of photons gains and, and um, losses as a function of light intensity. So there, there seems to be some quantum billiard effect by which, by which uh, electron, photos, photons can be gained, emitted, gained, emitted multiple times along the, the interaction with the, with the sample. This was actually resolved uh, neatly in the, in the group of Klaus uh, Ropers a, a few years ago. And by now, this is a mature uh, field and then people have been using this technique to probe on the linear response of, uh, of, of different structures, for example, uh, of, of uh, photonic crystals. People can produce up to hundreds of photon exchanges uh, between the electrons. This happens in a nanosecond time scale, and, uh, and the, actually they have also managed to reduce the size of the, of the electron pulse by doing this down to less than one femtosecond. Okay, so connection to harmonics, actually we've been looking into the possibility of using this technique to explore the harmonic generation. And uh, the result is that, uh, that if you plug the numbers, uh, uh, it, it should work. So basically the idea is you pump a nanostructure, generate harmonics, and normally you look at the far field and that's already hard enough. But with an electron beam, you can focus the electron down to about one nanometer size or less. Actually, the, the, the state of the art is uh, half an astron uh, of, the, of the beam spot. 
and then uh, interact not only with the linear field, but also with harmonic fields, okay? With the linear field, you just have um, a, a coherent process by which you up there absorb photons or emit photons, and this gives a symmetric spectrum, that's red point. But when you have uh, um, harmonic generation, then the harmonics just produce an, an imbalance in this, uh, in this uh, um, uh, exchange of photons, and that, so it produces an asymmetric spectrum. And you can see this uh, even for a, a sphere, a gold sphere, a nanoparticle. These are calculations done with realistic uh, uh, intensities, with realistic sizes of the, of the material, like 20 nanometer or so, nanoparticle, etc. This is, this is uh, uh, centrosymmetric, but still you have a second harmonic field. It doesn't radiate because it's centrosymmetric, but it's there. And you can probe it with electron. And so this is a technique that in principle can allow you to uh, probe the nonlinear response, including har harmonic generation, uh, with a very good spatial resolution in the nanometer range, okay? And the very last thing I wanted to, to mention is uh, when you have an electron, and uh, this, this electron is, is, is moving in your electron microscope in vacuum. Of course, the electron has an electromagnetic field associated with it. It's evanescent because it doesn't radiate in vacuum. It's just an evanescent field. And this is the one that you use to probe or excite the sample. Now, what happens when you have your electron passing near a structure? How does it compare this with light? And this is a calculation that uh, Joel and I did um, uh, and published this, this year. So this is, this is the, um, uh, the, as a function of the distance between the electron and also the size of the structure, so it's, it's all compacted in this uh, horizontal axis, you see what is the equivalent fluence of, uh, of a pulse, of a, of a laser pulse, that will provide the same level of, uh, of uh, exposure, of electromagnetic exposure uh, of the sample as one electron. So one electron, the pulse of one electron, is equivalent to a fluent or to a light pulse of this fluence. Okay, and so with this is with electron beam, and now this is the threshold for triggering nonlinearity, high nonlinearity in graphene or in gold. So you can see that an electron can, in principle, a single electron can, in principle, trigger nonlinear response in in graphene. This is actually something that you see as the time traces of the polarization in a graphene flake, as electron flies over it, and then you can see depending on the, if you consider an artificial electron that has a, a charge, this would be an electron, charge minus E, but if you consider it very, very non-linear, uh, uh, for, for, uh, for artificially enhanced the charge by a factor of four, then you see that the, the, the trace goes completely different. Even when you lower this, so that would be the, the very linear regime. One electron is already, is already different from this regime. So it's already triggering uh, non-linearity, right? And the clear way to, do, to see this is just by doing the calculation. So what is the linear uh, emission, uh, emission probability for, I mean, you, you come with uh, the electron and maybe it emits uh, photons. So this is cathode luminescence, it's a well-established technique. So if you do the calculation linearly or non-linearly, it's, uh, it's actually very different. So I think this is a good uh, playground to explore harmonic generation. Uh, uh, in, in this is a trigger and triggered by just uh, uh, electron beams, okay? And with that, I would like to conclude. I hope to be more or less uh, in time. And so uh, thanking uh, our funders and also all of the members of, of the group. I should have put uh, Joel's photo here because he's been contributed to this talk, but he will uh, speak later in the session. So we'll also have an opportunity to, to see, uh, interact with him. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. So I forgot to mention in the beginning, if you have questions, please write them in the chat and then I can unmute you and you can ask the question yourself. So at the moment, I don't see questions, so I will ask one. Uh, you showed these linearized equations. So the Dirac-like equation for your graphene flakes so how does it work for finite systems? There are these uh, edge states, but you are using uh, a dispersion relation for the bulk. So how does this go together? You mean in the time binding model or? Yes. So when you linearize, 
how do you take the edge states into account? Yes, they, they come directly because uh, basically they, they come um, uh, from, maybe I can show here. I think they, uh, well, you, you have this uh, site basis set and you produce this tie binding solution. So these are the, the um, eigenstates of the electrons and, and they are there already. This is before even you do the, before you even do the linear response, you, uh, you have to get the eigenstates of the electron eigenstates of the system. And if you have, uh, for example, edge states because you, you have zigzag um, edges, then they will be there. So these are the, I mean, if you linearize and you obtain this Dirac like equation, uh, yes. then how, how do you add the edge states after the linearization? The edge states. Yeah, can you show the slide with a Dirac like equation when you linearize around the Dirac cone? Ah, yeah. Okay, here. And how do you treat the edge states after you linearized? Yeah, this is this is different. This is this is uh, this is different. This is for uh, extended graphing, and then the edge states were not included in this in this uh, particular equation. But also uh, the samples were chosen in a, in a way so that does not need. Uh, well, you have extended, uh, I mean, this is a fantastic model to, to apply to extended graphene or also to nanostructures where you, where you uh, after, after uh, um, you um, uh, adopt a local approximation and you just forget about all edge states, etc. And this is good when there are no edge states, for example, in, uh, in armchair structures. Mm -hmm. Okay, Fernando has a question. Yes, Javier, thank you for the nice talk. Um, regarding the first part of your talk, when you talk about the intrinsic nonlinearity or strong nonlinearity of graphene, could you say a bit more on the role of doping? Uh, so, is that um, it, what happens at zero doping? Is there a big difference between zero doping and uh, non zero doping? Uh, could you say a bit more on, on that? Yes, what I can say is uh, the, it, it um, common, I mean, uh, intuition works in the sense that uh, uh, when you have a very low doping, then, then the, the, uh, the physics that happens at the Fermi level, the electron motion at the Fermi level, is going to be very, very different from, for example, a regular uh, semiconductor, because uh, you are sensitive to the linear, to the, to the conical dispersion relation of the system. But if you increase the level of doping, so you increase more and more the level of doping, Eventually, you you are far away from the from the Dirac uh, uh, point, and then uh, what happens is that this be becomes more and more like a regular metal, right? So it doesn't matter so so much if you populate the band a lot. It doesn't matter so much if your uh, dispersion relation is linear or parabolic, right? And so it's going to be harder to engage nonlinear response if you increase the doping. Thank you. Okay, Carlos Hernandez Garcia has a question. I try to unmute you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I have a question. Can you span a little bit more on the origin of the harmonics blue shift in the experiment you did with Jens? Yeah. Yes, this one, no? Yeah. So basically, uh, as, you, as the pulse is progressing through, through the material, so basically, you are you are as the pulse is progressing through the material, you are metallizing the system. So you are creating uh, electrons and holes here, and that are going to be able to to I mean the the, the later part part of the of the pulse is going to interact with a system that is already changed because you have. So in the, the, the first part of the pulse interacts with the regular graphene system. Then uh, the next part, uh, after you create these transitions, the, the following part interacts with the system in which you have electrons here and holes here that are, can, can have plasmonic-like interaction. So the response mm -hmm. of the system will be, will be uh, different. As a result of that, then the, the shape of the pulse that is, that is uh, uh, emitted effective pulse that is interacting with the system is going to to to, to change in, in shape and that's what causes this uh, blue shift 
-hmm. So it, it is within, let me put it here. Yeah, it is, I mean, this is, these are, these are not the uh, right intensities, no? It's everything is normalized to one. Yeah, you yeah, can yeah. see that uh, eventually this is, this shift is within the, the incident pulse. Mm -hmm. And how long was the incident pulse? Uh -huh. I think it was, in this case, it was uh, 17 uh, femtoseconds, I believe. Uh -huh. Okay, okay, thank you. Right. But you can yes. see here as a, as a function of pulse duration. So, ah, okay, yeah, yeah. 70 femtoseconds, but also you have as a function of pulse duration. I think that's what mm -hmm. the shortest. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't see further questions in the chat. So, thank you, Rafi, again. It was very thank nice much. presentation. Can I stop sharing now? Yes, thank yes. you very much for So, the next talk is by Rui Silva. Yeah. You will speak on high harmonic spectroscopy or strongly correlated and topological materials. So, do you see my screen? Yes, not yet in full screen. Okay. Now it's full. Oh, sorry. I don't know why this is. Sorry. Something is. Uh, I'm just going to. Yes. Now you see everything, no? Yes. My mouse? Okay. Perfect. Uh, so my name is Rui Silva and I'm here to present uh, the work that I've done in high harmonic spectroscopy of strongly correlated and topological materials. Um, so I work at, oh, sorry. So I work at the, um, at the Autonoma of Madrid and this work was started at the MBI and then I follow up this work at the uh, one. Uh, thanks to the organizers for letting me to present this, this, this work in this conference. So I, I will begin with, with the, the authors, um, the, the authors of this work, uh, Alvaro Jimenez Galan at the MBI, Misha Ivanov at the MBI, and also August Mirnov at the Max Born Institute, uh, Bruno Morin at the Universidad de Mino in Portugal, uh, Fernando Martin at UAM, Igor Blinov, and Alexei Rugotsov at the Russian Quantum Center. So I just give you the menu of the of the of the talk. So I will start talking about the how can we time resolve the, the insulator to metal transition in a strongly correlated material using high harmonic generation. Then I will talk about how can we distinguish uh, between different topological phases uh, in the Alden model using high harmonic generation. And I will end my presentation by showing you uh, uh, the, the maximum localized vanier functions as a good basis for solving the semiconductor block equations. So to start with, I will start with the time resolving the, 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 the insulator to metal transition. This work was, was, was done in collaboration with Igor Blinov, with Alexei Rubotsov from the Russian Quantum Center and with August Mirnov and Misha Ivanov at the MBI. So to begin with, I would like to briefly explain what is the origin of harmonics in solids. So, Sorry, Rui. Yeah. Uh, there is a window in, on, in front of your presentation uh, from PowerPoint. That it says that uh, PowerPoint ah, okay. isn't responding. Can you remove it because it's covering your presentation? Thank you. Oh, but it's, it's because I don't have PowerPoint. It's kind of strange. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see this. There is no problem. Sorry, no, no, it's okay, sorry. Okay, so, so yeah, I, I am using a PDF. So um, there is a, so you have a, a valence band and a conduction band. And initially you have all the electrons uh, filling the valence band and the conduction band is completely empty. You start to, to shine your, your sample with a, with a laser field. And then you have a little bit of transfer of population between the valence band and the conduction band, mostly at the, at the region where the band gap is minimum. And then once you have an electron created in the conduction band, the laser field can, can drive the, the electron in the, in the conduction band and this creates intraband harmonics. So these intraband harmonics are the harmonics that, that dominate the, the low order response in, in the harmonic signal. And also you create electron hole uh, pairs and the, the electron hole polarization will create uh, the interband harmonics. So you can 
you can then recombine an electron and a hole and you give uh, origin to a photon that is uh, more or less the, the difference in energy between the valence band and the conduction band. So what I'm going to today is to, to see what is the effect of electron correlation. Indeed, I'm going to show you what is the effect of, 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 of having a strongly correlated uh, material uh, going through high harmonic generation. For that, I'm going to choose the Hubbard model. And why do I choose the Hubbard model? Is because it's the simplest model in which electron-electron correlation is, is explicitly taken into account. It contains a lot of many-body physics. We can solve exactly uh, using uh, exact analyzation, at least in, in, in one dimension. And we don't, uh, we don't have any ad hoc assumptions for the, for the electron-electron correlation. So what is the uh, Hubbard model? So we have a bunch of sites, and in each site you can have either one, zero, or two elections with spin up or spin down. And then you have two parts in the Hamiltonian here. So you have the hopping Hamiltonian that only is, is just a tight binding Hamiltonian for one band, and where T0 is the hopping parameter. And then you have the repulsion Hamiltonian that is, a, that is not a single particle, uh, but it's not, it's, the, it's, the, it's not a single particle operator that, that uh, tells you that whenever you have two electrons sitting at the same site, your Hamiltonian, this, is, this costs some energy, and this is U, this is the electron repulsion uh, energy. So this Hamiltonian is highly non-trivial, uh, even in one dimension. So we can, we can go and look for, for two limits of the, of the Hubbard model. We can go for the limit where U is very, very small, so we have only a uh, tight binding of one band. And in the case in, in which we are going to treat, that is the half field system, so we have one er electron per site, uh, we have just a conductor. And if we shine with a laser field, we are going just to see intraband harmonics. In the other limit, we have the U equals to infinite uh, limit. And this is the limit where, where U is way, way bigger than T0. And at all filling in the ground state, the doubly occupied states are completely forbidden. So you have one electron per site and the, there, are, there is no possibility of having two electrons at the same site. And you also have the presence of short range antiferromagnetic order. So it means that uh, adjacent spins are antiparallel. So we have spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down. And this is what we called uh, a MOT insulator. So when we couple the Hubbard model with a laser field, we, we can just couple the, the laser field by just putting a pearls phase in, in, the, in the Hamiltonian. Sorry about it. Um, and, and this is, oh, sorry. Uh, and this is just the, um, the, this phase here. This is the pearls phase. And when you shine uh, a laser field in, into the Hubbard model, what you can do is to force an electron that was initially here at the hole uh, to jump to an adjacent site. And then you will create a Dublin hole pair. And then this Dublin hole pair is able to conduct electricity. So what you, what you can do with a stronger laser field is to create a Dublin hole pair and then you, have, uh, you start initially with an insulator and then you end up with a metal. So how can you produce or, or what is the physics behind this double and whole pair uh, production? So we, in, in the one dimensional Hubbard model, we can, we can solve um, quasi analytically using the Beth ansatz. And we know that the charge excitations of the, of the Hubbard model are gapped from the ground state by, by delta, that is the mod gap, that is, uh, well, at least for a very large U, is really proportional to U. Uh, and your charge excitations have a bandwidth of eight times T0. So, uh, and also we, we, we know from, from the analytical solution, the, the correlation length. So it is the typical length uh, or the typical distance between a Dublin and a whole pair in, in, in the excitation. So to create, um, a double and whole pair, what we need to do is to shine uh, with, a, with, a, with an electric field that is strong enough to, to give uh, the energy delta to create this double and whole pair. So we need to give the energy this, this, this delta 
and and this is just the work so you if you place this this 2e uh, xi uh, here in this part of the equation you see that this is just the work so this is the 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 charge 2e is just the charge of the double of the double and xi is the the length that you need to 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 separate the double hole pair and this was 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 really uh, stated in in this article by Takashi Oka. So what we are going to do now is to solve the the one D Hubbard model using uh, using exact diagonalization, and we are going to to shine a strong laser field and see what is the the what is the high harmonic response. And for that we have used parameters to to simulate. Uh, these this 1D potential mod insulator and what, what, you, what we are going to do is to scan the value of Q. So we are going to do several calculations from U equals to zero, that is a pure conducting system, to U equals to 10, that is a pure mod insulator. So what we see and is that, uh, okay, so this N eta of T is just the, the spin-spin correlation function and I'm going to plot here in, in this in this in this counter plot, in this color plot, the time evolution of the spin-spin correlation function for several calculations. So each horizontal stripe is a calculation with a different value of u. So as I previously said, the the, the double and whole pair productions has a threshold character. So as soon as you as you go through um, as soon as you surpass and you overpass this threshold field, you start to create the one hole pairs. So what we see is that, so this blue, this white line is the line in, it's the, the moment in time in which our laser field is, is able to surpass the, the threshold field. So we see that we don't see any dynamics or for example, when, if you follow my mouse, you don't, we don't see any dynamics on the, on the spin spin correlation function up to the moment in which we cross the threshold field and then we start to create, uh, to destroy the spin-spin correlation. So we go from a short range antiferromagnetic uh, material to a paramagnetic material. And we clearly see that the transition occurs only if the, the, the electric field surpasses this threshold field. We, uh, now I'm going to show you the, the double and whole pair. So I was previously showing the spin-spin correlation function, and I'm going to show you the number of double and whole pairs that we created in the system. And as in the previous figure, the, the, the number of the double and whole pairs starts to be almost zero. And as soon as we surpass this, this, this threshold field, we start to create double and whole pairs, and then we, 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 we destroy our, in, our insula insulator and we create a, 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 metals, a metallic system. Also, when we see the ground state population decay, we see that the, the, the ground state uh, decays really. So we have these oscillations, but these oscillations are normal because we are just inside the laser field and, and the, the ground state population oscillates within the laser field. But we see that for the values uh, of u, for example, for u equals to four, we see that the, the, um, the ground state, state population decay to zero uh, really after we cross the, the threshold field. And this transition occurs in approximately one laser cycle. So the question now is, can we trace this phase transition uh, with the optical response or with high harmonic generation, okay? So I'm going to show you here the high harmonic generation spectra for different values of U. So now each uh, vertical stripe is just a calculation of a high harmonic generation for different values of U. And you clearly see that the harmonic emission when u is, is, is smaller than two, so here, when we have like a, a, a conducting uh, like uh, system or a conducting like ground state, you see that the, um, the emission is, is really uh, composed by intraband harmonics. So you see the first, the fourth, and the fifth harmonic. When we go up and we increase the value of u, we see that our, our high harmonic generation signal completely uh, changes. So now the, the harmonic generation, so this red line is, is just delta, that is the optical, the optical mod gap, and this is delta plus eight ty times T zero, and you see that the high harmonic generation is really concentrated in this region of the, of the, of the spectrum. And 
this spectrum is completely different from the, um, from the spectrum that we are used to see in atoms or in, in semiconductors. And since the, 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 all the, the, the relevant energies are between delta and delta plus eight times, time, times T zero, that is the bandwidth of our double and whole pairs excitations, the, uh, the formation of double and whole pairs must be responsible for the harmonic emission in, the, in this region of, of U, okay? So what, what, we, what I'm going to show you here is that we can see uh, by looking at the, the high harmonic generation, uh, time, resolved, uh, time resolved high harmonic generation, we can see and trace back the, 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 the time in which we are going through a phase transition. So I'm showing you time profile of the harmonic emission for U equals to five times T zero. And we see that here in blue, uh, I'm showing the, the double and whole pairs production. And you see that the harmonic emission that I'm showing here as a Gabor profile uh, really coincides with the times where I, the, the, the number of double and whole pairs is, is, is increasing. And also it coincides where, where, when the, our ground state population is decreasing, the, the, the red line. So after, and after reaching, reaching a saturated state, it is around here, uh, we, we don't see any more uh, high harmonic uh, emission. So we can time the, the phase transition using high harmonic spectroscopy. So is this, sorry, is this just a, an optical breakdown? And I argue that it's not, it's, it's, it's more than that because we see an abrupt change of the ground state population within a laser cycle. Uh, we see the we start with with a with a paramag uh, with a short range antiferromagnetic material and we end up with a paramagnetic metal. So we have the a drastic change of properties of the system, uh, and and this is arguably a, a phase transition. So now I'm going to change, uh, and I'm going to focus on the high harmonic spectroscopy of topological insulators. Uh, we have done this work using the Halden model. And this work was done in collaboration with Alvaro that made um, a huge, huge part of, of, of the work. Uh, Bruno Amorim at the Universidad de Domingo that helped us uh, with the analytical part. And Olga Smirnova and Misha Ivanov uh, also at Max Born Institute. So what is a topological insulator? So I usually think of a topological insulator like a, a Ferrero Rocher, like a chocolate. Uh, so you have chocolate inside, so it's, it represents the, the insulating bulk, and you have the aluminum foil that covers the Ferrero Rocher, that is the conducting surface. And this happens because in a topological insulator, when you diagonalize or when you see the band structure of the, of the bulk, you see that at the Fermi energy, you, you don't have any uh, density of state, so your, your bands are gapped. But as soon as you, as you, as you go uh, and see the, um, and see the surface states, you see that you have some surface states that lie within the, the Fermi energy. And these surface states are the responsible for the conducting uh, properties of the surface in the topological insulator. In particular, we are going to focus on the anomalous quantum hole insulators. That is, we have a uh, hole resistance with the, without a magnetic field, and this hole resistance is quantized and in this proportional to the churn number that is just uh, the integral over the brilliant zone of the Berry curvature. And what is the Berry curvature? So the Berry curvature in, in, the, in the reciprocal space acts as an effective magnetic field in the brilliant zone. So uh, usually we see that the, the, the velocity of a semi-classical electron of, of a Bloch electron is usually given by the, the gradient of the dispersion energy in the, of the band. But if we have a Berry curvature, we have an extra term that is just the cross product of, of the laser field that, that is proportional to, to the derivative of K uh, in time cross with the Berry curvature. So you see that here the, the Berry curvature really looks like uh, the effect of a magnetic field in, in for, for, for a, a, an electron. If we have inversion symmetry and time reversal symmetry, where this uh, Berry curvature has some, some constraints. So indeed we have that uh, sigma of K needs to be sigma of minus K if we have inversion symmetry and if we have time reversal symmetry, we have that 
sigma of k needs to be the minus sigma of minus k. If you want to look more into, into topological insulators, I would recommend this, this, this colloquium in, in reviews of modern physics that is very nice for an introduction in topological insulators. So we are going to work with the Alden model because the Alden model was the first, uh, first model to, to, to be proposed as a topological insulator. And it is really the, 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 the beginning of, of the topological physics. Uh, you, you really need to, to work uh, with the Alden model to start looking at topological physics. So the Alden model is graphene based. So you have a lattice of, of uh, an exa uh, a lattice of graphene. And, and um, you start with the tight binding uh, Hamiltonian of graphene and you see here the band structure. And since in graphene we have inversion symmetry and time reversal symmetry, our Berry curvature that is shown here is zero everywhere in the brilliance. Uh, then what you need to do is to break inversion symmetry and time reversal symmetry to construct the Alban model. So we first break time reverse, uh, in inversion symmetry and when we break inversion symmetry, we just get a massive graphene or for example, boron nitride, hexagonal boron nitride. So we open a gap at K and K prime, and now our, our barrier curvature is no longer zero, but it is, it is uh, an, an even, um, an even uh, function. So since it's an, um, an even function, or it's an odd function, uh, so since it's an odd function, the integral over the, the, of the, over the Berry curvature along the brilliant zone is just zero. So we don't have any uh, chance of having a topological insulator. But we can break time reversal symmetry by including a, a second nearest neighbor hopping that is imaginary. And by doing that, we break time reversal symmetry so we don't we don't have no longer the, 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 the symmetry in the band structure between K and K prime. And we, you see that uh, here, our, our Berry curvature can now be, uh, can, can have, no, doesn't have any constraints. So we can have this integral to be uh, one or two or, or minus one. In this case, in Aldan model, it's either one, either minus one or either zero. So what I'm going to show you here is really the band energies and, and, and the phase diagram for, for, for the Alden model. So here at, at, the, at the top, I'm showing you the trivial case. And, and so you have here the parameter space for T2 and here phi. And you see that you have a region where you have a trivial phase. So your churn number is equal to zero. So mu is equal to zero. And you have here, mu is equal to one. So I'm going to choose two points that are very, very close to the boundary of the, of the topological phase transition. And I'm going to show both the band structure and the, and the barrier curvature in, in, the, in the conduction band, in the valence band. Uh, so you see here that the, the band structures are almost identical between the trivial and topological. So we, I've chosen uh, these, these, these gaps or, or these parameters to to, to be able to have the same band gap in both cases. But what you see is that the change occurs on the sign of the Berry curvature in K. So you see that in, 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 in the trivial case, we have that um, the Berry curvature is positive, have a positive uh, sign. And when we go to the topological case, we, we see a change in the sign of, of, the, of, the, of the Berry curvature at K. And K is really the point that, that, that has a minimum band gap. So this is where we expect to have uh, most dynamics occur when we shine with a laser field because uh, we, we expect ionization from the conduction to the valence band to be dominated at this region. So can we take advantage of, of this change of sign to really see the, the phase transition? So how can we use uh, high harmonic generation to distinguish between these two phases? Can we use this fact, this change of sign in the Berry curvature in K to, to distinguish between, between, between both phases? So we, we have done some, some, some numerical calculations. We have used uh, three microns and, and 40 megavolts per centimeter. And we have uh, 
use the, a, la a linear laser uh, polarized along the gamma k. So it's, it's polarized along the, the y direction, okay? So if you see the trivial and the topological ca case, uh, the band, band structures are almost identical. And when you see the high harmonic generation spectra of the trivial and the topological, they are mostly the same. So high harmonic, high harmonic generation intensity is almost blind to the topological phase transition. So can we do anything else with high harmonic generation? And the thing is that we can look on the ellipticity of the high harmonics. So what I'm showing here is the Berry curvature of the valence band of the, of the conduction band in the trivial case on the left. And on the right, I'm going to show you the same thing for the topological case. So imagine that you have, uh, so the band gap, the minimum band gap is at K. So we expect that electrons are promoted to the conduction band mostly at K point. And in the trivial case, uh, all the electrons that are in the conduction band that are then are going to be driven by, by the laser field uh, are going to feel these uh, positive, uh, um, positive Berry curvature. On, 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 on the other hand, um, when, when we have uh, the topological case, we see that uh, the, 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 the harmonics are going to, the electrons are going to feel a, a negative Berry curvature. So I'm going to show you uh, the ellipticity of, of harmonics. So this is the ellipticity of harmonic one. And it's really striking that we, we don't see any change because I've told you before that uh, the, the, the elections show, are going to feel here uh, um, uh, positive in the trivial case. In the topological case, they are going to feel a, a negative uh, a negative Berry curvature. So that, that should be a difference, but there is no difference because the first harmonic is really, uh, um, um, in the topological case, is really dominated by the whole conductivity of the valence band. So that's why the, the, the ellipticity of harmonic one is really the same for the trivial and the topological case. But we have uh, yeah. five minutes left for speaking. Ah, oh, okay, okay, for, nice. Uh, so for the harmonic three, we see really this change. So by and also for harmonic nine, so all the higher harmonics, we see this trend. So we can really see the difference between um, between the two topological phases by looking at the change in the ellipticity of harmonics. So in trivial phase, we have that the linear and higher harmonics have the same ellipticity, and in the topological phase, the the ellipticity of higher harmonics. Uh, is, is uh, the ellipticity of linear and high harmonics is the opposite. So we can reconstruct the topological phase using high harmonic generation. So we can just take ellipticity of harmonic one as a reference and then look at ellipticity of harmonic three. And here is the reconstruction. So this is the theoretical. And each point here is a calculation in which we reconstruct the, the churn number based on the ellipticity of high harmonics. So we can reconstruct all the phase diagram by looking at the ellipticity of harmonic response. Since I have little time, I'm going to, to be very brief on this. So I'm going to show you how we can use uh, maximum localized linear functions as a basis for solving the semiconductor block equations. Uh, and this work was done in collaboration with Fernando Martin at UAM and, and with Misha Ivanov at the MBI. So to calculate the linear, non-linear response of crystals, we can have several methods. We have TDDFT, that is computational, computationally very demanding. It's ab initio, but, but the results are very hard then to, uh, to understand. We can have TDSC, but it's very hard to include uh, decoherence terms. And then we have the semiconductor block equations in which we have an easy interpretation of the results, and it is easy to include excitonic or decoherence effects. But to solve this, the semiconductor block equations, we can use two different ga uh, gauges. We can use the velocity gauge, in which all K points are decoupled, but then it's very hard to converge on the number of bands. And also the coherence is not straightforward in the velocity gauge. Uh, in the length gauge, re results are very easy to understand. Uh, it's very easy to converge on the number of bands, but it requires smooth transitional dipole moments along the brilliant zone. So the fact that we have gauge freedom to choose the eigenstate along the brilliant zone is problematic. So how, how can we circumvent this problem? 
So to really see uh, a lot of, of discussions on, on the semiconductor block equations and what is the problems of semiconductor block equations, you need really to go to and look at, at this recent paper by, by, by Metegarde and Glunio. So what I'm, so really the problem is this, that, that you can really put a random phase here to change the, the phase of, of, your, of, your, of your eigenstates along the brilliant zone. So what you need to do is to, to try to create a smooth and periodic cage. But this is very hard and model dependent to, to implement. And especially it's very difficult when we have a band crossings. And if we have a very high number of bands, so we have a spaghetti of bands, this is very, very hard to, to, to try to create a smooth and periodic cage along all the brilliance. So all problems arise when we diagonalize H of K. So what we can do is not to diagonalize H of K and just work, just like in molecular physics, we can work in a diabatic basis and get rid of all these problems. So our diabatic basis can be constructed using these maximum localized linear functions that are really described here in this review. So maximum localized linear function is a technique that allows us to, uh, to extract uh, localized vanier functions, so these Rm, from the FT calculations. And then you can construct, so if these R of M are sufficiently uh, localized functions, your, 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 your block functions that you construct from these, 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 these vanier functions are going to be very smooth along K. So if the vanier state is localized, Psi of K is very smooth in the brilliant zone. So, and, and then all the information is going to be stored in, in these two matrix elements. So this is the, the, the Hamiltonian uh, matrix elements between the Vanier states, and this is the dipole matrix elements between the Vanier states. And then all transition dipole moments are smooth in this gauge. And numerical propagation is very easier in the, is way easier in this basis. So I would like to, to recommend you the, to, to our recent uh, paper, that, that really explains this, this in detail. So to conclude, uh, um, we have shown that we can time resolve insulated to metal transition using high harmonic generation. The, the, the harmonic emission is located between the mod cap and mod cap plus AT0. So the, the harmonic emission really uh, relies on the production of the one hole pairs. And we can really trace uh, using high harmonic generation spectroscopy this insulated to metal transition. Uh, regarding the topological insulators, we, sh we have seen, we have shown that harmonic intensity, at least for linear polarized fields, is almost blind. Harmonic intensity is almost blind to the topological phase transition. But on the other hand, we can take advantage of the elipticity of the harmonics to, to, to see a fingerprint of the churn number. And uh, regarding the Vanier function, we have shown how to circumvent the problem of random phase in the transition dipole moments. And this is a easy numerical integration of, of the semiconductor block equation. So I would like to thank to all of you for your attention. I, I hope to be on time. Yeah, thank you very much for this very nice talk, Rui. So are there questions? I have a question. Marcello Chapina, you can unmute yourself. OK, thank you, Rui, for, for the very nice talk. So I have a question regarding the first two, two sections. So. Uh, you are using uh, one, only one one pulse to initiate the dynamics and to prove. So yeah. I'm thinking that you can use uh, two pulses. So how this works? I mean, for the first case, I think it's more or less clear. But for the second, so the same pulse that the, the pulse that does not anything about the change in the in the phase. So you you need to do something external so to change the phase. No, no. So, so what, what, what you need to do to do is really to look at the high harmonic signal, and then try to 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 see what is the elasticity of the high harmonic signal. So you really need. But, to, okay, but uh, but the phase doesn't change by the pulse itself. So no, no, no. In the second case, it doesn't. In the but, second but case, we uh, so you need we, to do something external. So you it, some magnetic uh, field or something. No. Okay, so in in the talk by Alvaro Jimenez. We, oh, have, okay. we have came to with an idea of how to change uh, more or less the, the topological characteristics of, of a material by, by using, uh, by using uh, two pulses oh. and by, by okay. changing the time delay. So Alvaro is going to talk about it. Okay, thank you. But okay. in, the, in, the, in the first case, yes. The first, we, yes. We, 
in the first case, we really, really go through, through a phase transition. In the second case, we just see what, in which phase okay. we are. Okay. Right. Okay, thank you. Good. Okay, Fernando has a question. Yeah, thank you, Rui. I just would like to ask, you have been working with a Hover model, but sometimes that exaggerates the, the repulsion between electrons. So how do you expect uh, these things to evolve gradually through towards a standard, more standard Coulomb interaction? Ah, in the Hubbard model. So, uh, okay, so to see these effects, I would really, you would really need to, 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 to have a material that is uh, really a 1D or, or a, mod, a really good mod insulator. So like this cooperates, uh, because in, in uh, okay, so if you have a normal material and you include uh, Coulomb effects, then you will, would not see these kind of things because the Coulomb uh, repulsion is not enough uh, to, 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 to be dominant. So you need really to see this kind of effects. You need really a material that is uh, almost dominated by, by, or yeah, almost dominated by electron repulsion. Yeah, I would okay. say. Like these cuprates. So you, you, really to see this, you would need to have a very, very good mod insulator. So people are thinking about cuprates for, as a good candidate. Thank you. So we have another question by the Wang. Uh, yes. So uh, my question is about the HAG in the topological insulator, where you plot this uh, ellipticity dependence. I, I, I wonder the, is, is the x-axis uh, ellipticity and what is the vertical axis and what is the boundary you see between this bluish and uh, reddish? Okay. So for example, in, in this figure that I'm showing now, yeah, is that what mm -hmm. you are talking about? Yes. Okay, so, so I am really doing, uh, for each, each point here is really a, a different calculation. Uh, so I, I change the, the, the parameters of, of my type binding model and I run a calculation and I see what is the, the ellipticity of harmonic one and harmonic three. So this is really, um, the, so phi is really the parameter that I change in the phase of the T2, and, and this is really the, the T2 being changed. So, so, so I'm really doing for each point here, so more explicitly here, for example, here for each point, I'm doing a calculation with a T2 that is given by, by these uh, Y axis and, and with a phi given by this uh, X axis. Okay. I don't know if I'm if I answer my your your question or not. Okay, maybe I should read your paper more carefully. I think I know a bit more now. So I get this is written in this paper. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. I just need to read the details to understand better. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I don't see further questions. So then let's thank Hu again. Okay, thanks a lot. And the next speaker is Roberto Boyero Garcia. And this is a 20 minutes talk. And the idea is that you talk for 15 minutes and we have five minutes of discussion. And I will give you a hint after 12 minutes. Okay, do you hear me? Yes, now you can share your screen. Okay. Okay, so good morning to everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank to, to the organizers to invite me to give this talk. Uh, my name is Roberto Boyero Garcia, and I am a PhD student from the University of Salamanca. And today I'm talking about the macroscopic behavior of high harmonic generation in single layer graphene dominated by a phase matched ring. So, uh, as you well know, uh, graphene is a zero cap solid. Both conduction and valence band are in contact in the collect direct points. That particular structure leads to a different way to generate high, harmonic, high harmonics. Instead, to promote the electrons uh, to the conduction band through tunnel excitation, like infinite gap solids, we just need to move the electron at the direct points and the electron hole pair is generated. Then, similar to other solids, the electron is accelerated by the, the electric field until it recombines with the hole in real space and emits the high orders, harmonics. This is the called interband contribution, but the intraband movement of the electron in each band also generates high harmonics. 
but its contribution is much lower, as we will see in the next slides. So um, the, the microscopic behavior of high harmony generation in graphene has been studied theoretically. In particular, in our group, we have two different works where the microscopic behavior of the high harmonic generation in graphene has been studied through the numerical re resolution of the de time dependent Schrodinger equations. In the first one, we presented a full description of the process. And also we go a bit further in this second one and we saw the optical response of the gapless graphene when the driving pulse has different polarizations. Tomorrow, my college, Oscar uh, Zurron Cifuentes, is going to give you a talk explaining all the theory about the description of the process. So if you have any doubt, I invite you to be there. So uh, once we have a complex description from a microscope point of view, the next step for us is to go deeper in the dynamics. For that, first we focus on high harmonic generation in gases. Um, there are two well-known phenomena that I want to talk to you. The first one uh, is the power scaling of high harmonic, which are almost constant for all the harmonics in the plateau. Uh, therefore, the process is non-perturbative. The second one is the collet intrinsic phase, which is consequence of the driving field distribution along the transversal plane. The emission in the center is generated by a field with different amplitude and phases than, for example, in the corners. Thus, the coherent addition could be destructive at the end in the detector. The question now is if those two characteristics of high harmonic generation in gases appear also when we use graphene. So in order, in order to estimate the nature of the process, we represent in this first picture the scaling intensity of the high harmonics with the driving field intensity. The solid lines indicate the fit which allow us to extract the power scaling P for each one. Now in this second, in this second one, we saw the extracted power scaling as a function of the harmonic order for three different driving intensities. As we can see, we can conclude two things. The factor P for every harmonic is almost the same and is less than the order of the harmonic. So this is clearly reflects the non-perturbative the non behavior of high harmonic generation in graphene, similar than happens in gases. Now, to see if the transversal phase matching is relevant also in high harmonic generation in graphene, we present a macroscopic study. For that, we need to take into account two things, the propagation of the harmonics to the detector and also possible effects of a phase mismatch from the different contribution coming from the layer. For the propagation, we just use the Maxwell equation and to reproduce the phase matching effects, we place several single graphene cases along the transversal plane and, use, and we use a Gaussian mean distribution for the driving pulse. The first result that we get is a comparison of the harmonic yield between the macroscopic emission, that red fill area from here, and the microscopic emission, the dark blue line. We also present the contributions of, of the intraband for both cases. The light blue line correspond to the microscopic case and the red dark line to the macroscopic case. Both the spectra present a non-perturbative plateau of harmonics extending uh, toward a cutoff frequency. Uh, those plateaus are clearly dominated by the interband contribution, the intraband affects only to the low harmonics, but as we can see, the coherent addition in the macroscopic case cleans the spectrum, showing more visi visible harmonics in the plateau. That phenomenon is universally observed in experiments of high harmonic generation in solids. Then it's obvious that the phase matching affects a lot to the results. So to try to know more about how it is working, we have calculate the emission of points from different distance to the center. So this is the layer, we select different points uh, with different distance from the center. 
that allow us to know how the intensity and the phase of each harmonic is while we move along the transversal plane. And as we predicted, the generation varies for each point, but if we focus on the intensity distribution, we can see that there is a radial range where the yield is maximum and seems to be the same for every harmonic. Actually, if now we move to the phase distribution, it seems to be clear, uh, near constant for each harmonic in the same radial range. For example, if we take uh, an, an harmonic, the 21, we see that the phase is the same for almost all the radii, this orange zone of here. Instead, if, we've, if we move out of this zone, the phase changes quickly. That means that the coherent addition for those emissions of the radial range uh, will be constructive at the end. Now we can go further and calculate the power scaling P. For this case, to this amplitude, we get uh, P equal to 3.2. Then we can write the amplitude in the detector for every harmonic as a function of the radius and calculate where we get the maximum energy. And in our case, it's placed at 11.9 microns, microns, which is in the range that we have selected before, as you can see. So this result means that there is a certain ring who determines the total emission of the harmonic generation in single layer graphene because we obtain not only a maximum amplitude, also the phase varies slowly in that radius. Therefore, in the detector, we, we will have a constructive addition. Now we have calculated the center of the ring, but as we saw before, uh, seems like there are more radii where the harmonic intensity are um, high and the phase are almost constant. So trying to figure out uh, how is the width of the ring, we first saw the phase distribution, but this time respect to the ring phase, that phase from here. And just using those harmonics where in the macroscopic spectrum saw a clear peak. So the addition was constructive. Um, also, we calculate the ring emission for different widths. For microns, uh, correspond to the green ring, and 12 microns correspond to the purple one. And both centered in the optimal radius. Both analyses determine that the width of the ring is about 12 microns. We can see in this second picture from here that the 4 microns <coughs> ring is not enough to get the total emission. But with the 12 uh, microns ring, we recover the full high order harmonic spectrum, the macroscopy that we have in the background. So just to conclude, um, we have demonstrated the importance of a macroscopic analysis to try to predict experimental results. The propagation and the phase mismatch affect substantially in the process and they are necessary to compare with experimental results. Moreover, we have demonstrated via numerical simulation that the high harmonic generation in graphene has a non-perturbative nature. We also observe that the total emission depends on the driving field distribution. We have shown a dependency with the intrinsic phase like, like happens in gases. And finally, we have found that there is a phase matched ring at the target whose emission dominates the overall macroscopic emissions. So uh, that's all. Thank you for hearing me. Um, I want to highly recommend you the two talks of my colleagues, Ana Garcia Cabrera and Oscar Zorronzi Fuentes, which will take place tomorrow morning. Yeah, thank you very much, Roberto, for this nice talk and staying in time. Actually, you were too fast. Uh, yeah, too fast, please. Sorry. <laughs> well, are there questions? So I have one. How did you actually calculate this? So you made some tight binding model and solved it in position space. So calculated the currents at each point and then, so because you need the distance somehow, right, to your detector. Uh, yeah, but 
we just um, resolve a single cases of graphene for different amplitude because uh, if we move in the uh, far away from the center we have different amplitude of the driving pulse and just propagation to the propagated to the detector but so, you, you solve a schrodinger equation or yeah, schrodinger, yeah numerical schrodinger equation yeah and using the, the time binding approximation However, uh, my colleague, as I said before, Oscar Zurronti Fuentes is going to, to explain tomorrow exactly how we manage with this process. So now we have a question and run to you. I have to unmute you just a second. Where are you here? So now you Thank can. You. Yeah. yeah, you can hear me. Yes. yes. Thank you. Very nice talk. So just a quick question. So you probably already uh, aware of the, the work by Yoshi Kawa and Tanaka in Japan, and they did the, the experiment on graphene, right? So yeah. just a quick question whether you try to reproduce their results using your, your technique, and uh, can you also do electricity measurements, uh, I mean, exp uh, estimation to uh, compare to their experiment? Thank you. So, I mean, I think the question is about if we can recover uh, experimental results from the simulation. That's yes. something that because we have to You to, have seen, to check. I mean, in your report, you are showing like up to 50 harmonics order, right? But in the experimental results, you are showing only up to nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yes. the, the, the amplitude is higher, I think, if I'm not wrong. And I'm not sure if we are in the same wavelength. But uh, yes, that is a theoretical example that maybe in experimental setup is quite difficult to, or even in no one, any, any paper has this 50 harmonics. But we just use the same analysis that we make with high harmonic generation in gases, uh, but now using the graphene. I don't know if. So does this answer your question? Okay. Probably yes. I hope so so uh, you said that coherent addition results in cleaner spectra. Yeah. But actually, there are still a lot of non integer yes. harmonics. So <clears throat> some people say that. You need some damping mechanism to make it clean. Would you agree, or what is the reason? Uh, as we, I mean, we have noticed that in our simulation that there are uh, many trajectories that um, forbidden to clean more the spectrum. Uh, but I mean, the comparison with the microscopic is obvious that clean a lot the spectrum, they just take into account the phase matching. Mm -hmm. So maybe there are more trajectories because also we have to take into account the intraband microscope, so intraband contribution. And maybe if you check here, for example, at the beginning, uh, it's very noisy because we have a lot of contributions, but while we are uh, deeper in the in the plateau, the peaks are more clear. So, mm. yeah, probably something that we are going to, we are trying to to understand the trajectories and and know why is so noise this this kind of a spectrum for this amplitude. Mm -hmm. So, are there further questions to Roberto? I don't see any, so let's thank Roberto again. Okay, thank you very much. Bye bye. And the next speaker is Joel Cox. One thing, Dieter. Uh, yeah. Well, it's up to you as a chairman, but uh, perhaps we should respect the schedule. And if there is some time, let's just to make a break of five minutes. Uh, yeah. I don't know, uh, Mariella, would you agree? Because they have the, the conference organizers have um, have inf the conference organizers have. Um, Sorry. I, I could talk slowly if it helps. Yeah, I think it's about the starting time, which should be not earlier than in the program, right? Yeah. Yes. 
I, I can make a pause in, in the recording. Uh, I think that's not dangerous, but then I have to remember. Okay, let me. Okay, it's recording again. Okay. Please. So I shall start. Right. Um, well, thanks everybody uh, for being here, first of all. And uh, I also want to say thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk about the research that I'm doing. So this is a talk about uh, high harmonic generation in 1D systems, and it's a theory talk um, carried out in collaboration with uh, Sandra de Vega and Javier Garcia de Bajo at the Nanophotonics Theory Group in Barcelona, and also with uh, Fernando Sals in Madrid. And uh, the, so I'm going to talk again about 1D systems, but the inspiration of this work uh, as you might have guessed from Javier's talk earlier, it's coming from a 2D material, and that's graphene. So we've already heard a lot about graphene. I won't really say much more. Uh, we know about its band structure and these, uh, this linearized dispersion. And from the optoelectronics point of view, this is really nice because it's, uh, it's easily tuned between uh, zero-gap semiconducting and metallic states, right? So that's led to a lot of interesting technological applications. Uh, but also this linear band structure, uh, again, as you heard earlier today, it, it gives rise to an intrinsically anharmonic response to light, which is really nice uh, for nonlinear optics. So one of the first, uh, one of the simple reasons you can see this, uh, it was thought some time ago that, uh, well, you have these linear bands that will essentially resonate with light uh, at any frequency up to some uh, few EV. And this is ideal if you're going to do something like wave mixing or harmonic generation, where you have multiple frequencies of light uh, interacting. They can all find an interband transition to couple with, right? And then that can uh, lead to some kind of enhancements in the nonlinearity. Uh, and then, uh, as Javier was discussing, we also have this ability to have really anharmonic electron motion as the electrons in a in a in a populated band. So if you dope the graphene these electrons can move across the Dirac point and they instantaneously change sign in this, uh, in this, in this model. And you have this uh, anharmonic response to AC fields that contains all the odd harmonics with a high uh, concentration in the Fourier decomposition. And that's in stark contrast to the parabolic situation. Of course, real uh, materials are not perfectly parabolic, so you will have some nonlinearity there. But nevertheless, it's really nice uh, to see that with graphene. And also this uh, exotic band structure gives rise to uh, um, a strong nonlinearity associated with saturable absorption of light. So you have this intensity dependent uh, response if you consider CW illumination. So we explored that uh, in a few years back, looking at the intraband and interband contributions. Uh, depending on the frequency regime and, and the doping, you have a different uh, response. But graphene overall is a really strong saturable absorber. And this is because you really can easily induce a highly out of equilibrium electron distribution in this material. So this also comes to play when you're looking now at the high order harmonics you can generate in graphene. And uh, again, Javier did uh, talk about this, uh, this experimental work where you, you have this ability to excite this out of equilibrium distribution and essentially the pulse that you excite with to generate harmonics will will do that job and then the first half will do that and the second half of the pulse will experience this essentially optically doped graphene and that gives rise to this this blue shift that you can measure now on the other side of the coin uh, we can think about this ability to tune graphene from semiconducting and metallic states and if it's a metal you have this possibility of exciting collective charge density oscillations these are the plasmons in graphene. And uh, they have, they're incredibly confined. If you look at uh, these experiments that have done with scanning near field optical microscopy, where you have a tip that launches and images the plasmons in real space, uh, you can really see that these, these waves are indeed really com confined. They're highly compressed. And that gives you a huge, huge uh, electromagnetic field enhancement within your 2D layer. Now, uh, rather than exciting propagating plasmons because you need that uh, metallized tip to, to couple the momentum of the free space light with the momentum of the plasmon. That is what's being done in these experiments. 
You can instead pattern the graphene and then have nano resonators that support localized modes. And now you can just couple with light from free space. So depending on the application, this, is, uh, this can be a really nice way to go. You maintain this ability to actively tune the graphene. So that's really important that we maintain this uh, tuning with Fermi energy through electrostatic gating. And there's been a number of interesting experiments here for uh, sensing and also perfect absorption of light. So it's a strong light matter interaction. So obviously it makes sense to put these things together and you have intrinsically nonlinear material with a strong field confinement of the plasmons. And this is what Javier and I have been looking at in the last several years. We've been developing this idea of nonlinear graphene nanoplasmonics. So there's a recent review article. If you're interested in this topic, please check it out. We've summarized a lot of the work we've done in this field. And a lot of our predictions are based on uh, looking at basically uh, atomistic modeling of graphene nanostructures. So we can uh, talk about carbon atoms just represented by 2p orbitals and solve this uh, single electron density matrix equation of motion. So we have a phenomenological uh, relaxation rate that we can include here. That's the convenience of the density matrix. And we have a type binding Hamiltonian that works well for graphene. So the uh, electrostatic potential that you couple with is, is the light, of course, and then also this Coulombic electron-electron interaction. So this is what's giving you the collective flavor in the simulations, and it can describe the plasmons well. Uh, we do have a spin degeneracy included here, and then this Coulomb interaction has a finite on-site value for the 2p orbitals. So from the density matrix, we extract all the quantities we're interested in. Uh, and, and then we can look, of course, at harmonic generation. If we simulate interaction of uh, a graphene ribbon, for example, with an intense light pulse. And what we can do is target this central frequency of the pulse so it matches the plasmon resonance, and then see that indeed uh, you have a huge boost in harmonic generation. Uh, we compared this atomistic modeling with uh, the modeling for an extended system, solving semiconductor block equations, and then building in the field enhancement. And it does work well up to a point. Uh, in the atomistic model, you take into account the saturation of the near field enhancement more accurately. So we see a little bit of a damping compared to the uh, extended model. But overall, qualitatively, it's a great description. And uh, here you can see if we consider the frequency of the pulse sweeping in the x direction and then the output frequency in the y direction, and these contours are the emitted light uh, intensity, uh, clearly, the harmonics are showing up at the plasmon resonances where the field is strongly enhanced. So uh, this is confirmed in different models. Uh, we can look at not just 1D ribbons, but finite nanotriangles. And there you have the possibility to break inversion symmetry. And you can even generate even-ordered harmonics with a really high intensity, again, at the plasmon resonance. Overall, comparing graphene uh, without plasmons and with plasmons, we definitely get a boost from the plasmons. Uh, and, and then comparing to other crystals in experiments, we, we're still somehow doing well. Of course, it's a theoretical prediction, but it's encouraging. Uh, keep in mind, though, that the plasmonic field enhancement does tend to saturate earlier. So you win in, an, in efficiency earlier on in the intensity level, but then eventually, probably, you end up in a similar area. Right, so all of that research we did in graphene and the uh, nonlinear uh, optics of graphene and high harmonic generation, we started thinking about uh, how can we sort of put these ingredients together, this idea of uh, localized field enhancement and the intrinsic nonlinearity of the material. Is there a way we can think about optimizing that or study even like a toy model that can give us a lot of the underlying physics? Uh, and in particular, we want to concentrate on effects like the role of electron-electron uh, interactions. Of course, you need that if you're going to talk about optical resonances in the material, but also this synergy you could have with the electronic band structure, like we found in graphene. Of course, graphene isn't uh, perfect for every application, as it does have limitations, particularly with the plasmons, uh, considering the frequency ranges that they reside at. So the model, uh, this is now where uh, Sandra was really leading uh, research. Uh, she was a PhD in, in Javier's group and we were uh, supervising her. Also, Fernando was helping us here uh, in, this, in this work. And uh, we, we wanted to look at this a simple 1D model. It's the uh, SSH model uh, that I believe many of you are familiar with. And it's a, a simpler type binding model of a 1D chain. And you can have different hoppings between uh, 
the different uh, atoms in the cell. So you have two atoms per cell. We were considering here uh, 50 atom long chains and we took parameters kind of similar to graphene because we know them and you can also have carbon uh, linear chains uh, as a realistic system. That's actually what the SSH model was designed for. And the real nice thing here is that by tuning the hopping parameters in the different cells, you, you have uh, the ability to tune it from metallic to insulating uh, and then to topologically insulating phases, you could say. So basically we can introduce a gap in the, in the electronic spectrum, uh, in the topological insulator, we, we have the edge states really uh, of the chain that, that have these uh, that are introduced in the gap. Right, and uh, tape, we take hopping similar to graphene, and then we just sort of tune them arbitrarily to see the effect. To study the nonlinear response, we can borrow the same theory that uh, we developed for graphene. So this single electron density matrix picture, including the interactions. Uh, of course, here we don't have, we, we assume spin degeneracy. We don't have separate uh, spin states included. Uh, and we can solve this in the time domain, just directly integrating this equation of motion. Uh, but we can also, in a complementary way, solve this perturbatively. And that, that doesn't tell you about high harmonic generation, but it does give you an idea of how nonlinear the system will be. Uh, and also that gives you an idea in linear response where the optical resonances are in frequency space. And then the other uh, important ingredient of this this uh, study was uh, to include the optical resonances and in the spirit of graphene plasmonics, can we think about how we uh, add charge carriers modifying the electronic structure of the system? So essentially through doping. And uh, you can see that this obviously has, well, has an effect depending on the type of chain we consider. So for the metal, adding charge carriers uh, isn't going to do much because you're already in a metallic state. And then the area around the Fermi energy isn't really, uh, the, the features in the, in the electronic structure are not changing. So the Fermi energy moves, but it still sees the same kind of landscape and it's very uh, almost unperturbed. And in the gap uh, in the insulating uh, chain, you, you actually start to add charge carriers in the conduction band and now you're doping the material and you can start to see a, a plasmonic feature emerging in the optical response. So that's this low energy feature. Here you have these uh, interband uh, excitations that are somewhat tunable, uh, but eventually you quench them through polyblocking when you dope highly enough. And the same story goes for the topological insulator, except that you have these extra features in the band structure that you need to take into account. So that gives yeah, a few extra resonances here in this uh, linear response simulation. So one thing we can look at is uh, the response to intense CW light. So not yet the harmonic generation, but rather uh, CW light at a specific frequency and looking at the various resonances you find in the spectrum, even if the system is undoped, you can still look at the nonlinearity here. And we have a kind of shifting in the, in the, in the spectral features and a saturation. Eventually we really get into this bistable regime given uh, the, a large enough intensity. And while well, the simulation is, isn't really performing in that regime, but you can see how quickly uh, you get this onset. And so for the metal, we don't really have a strong uh, nonlinearity in that sense, but in the uh, gaps materials, we, we do find a very intense nonlinearity. It can be quite dramatic, especially for the topological insulator. And this behavior is sort of qualitatively described in the perturbative simulations if we look at the response associated with the care nonlinearity. So this allows us to predict which way the peak will shift or whether it will dominantly saturate or shift. And through doping, we can uh, either enhance this or, or, well, make it worse actually, depending on uh, how we do things. So we have a lot of tunability here to sort of think about how to optimize uh, plasmonic saturable absorption, for example. Now, if we look uh, at the response to intense ultra short pulses, so high harmonic generation now, and we do the same uh, sort of study as we did for the graphene ribbons and nano triangles, sweeping the input frequency and looking at the emitted light. Uh, this is a good way to map the nonlinearity. And we, of course, even in the undoped system, we have some kind of optical resonance. This in this metallic chain, there's still some kind of collective feature 
And that is driving harmonic generation uh, quite strongly. And we also see this uh, in the in the gapped systems with the, the insulator and the topological insulator. The topological insulator has this extra feature, of course, because you have these states residing in the gap that can couple to the light. And that re really seems to be giving a lot of uh, high harmonic generation quite effectively. But then we can look at what happens if we dope the system. We add a few charge carriers, uh, and that would effectively raise the Fermi energy slightly. And here now we introduce new optical resonances that really do drive the high harmonic generation more efficiently. Particularly for the insulator, we can compare at these uh, particular resonances highlighted here with the arrows. You can sort of see that the insulator is winning the race. Uh, the harmonics are persisting up to very high orders. Eventually, this model won't even work because we're going to go beyond the uh, the top of the bend. For the that will depend on the hopping energies that you're using, but it gives good qualitative uh, predict predictions. So if we go even further and strongly dope the material, we, we see these resonances eventually coalescing into single dominant features. And these are like the plasmonic, uh, strongly plasmonic features that have a lot of baked in field enhancements. Uh, and clearly they are dominating the nonlinearity here. They're driving it quite strongly. So that's one way essentially to get this extra level of uh, nonlinear response. I, think, I hope I'm not going over too far. Uh, I'm about done now. Uh, but the last part I want to focus on is, of course, the 1D chains are nice as a toy model. But uh, can we actually take what we've learned there and bring it to realistic systems? And the first thing that comes to mind is, is carbon nanotubes. These are inherently 1D structures. Uh, they can support plasmon resonances. We've explored this uh, in the past with Sandra. Uh, Javier and I, and uh, we also talk about this in this publication in uh, physical review research with the uh, SSH model. And we can look at the effect of doping, also changing the size. Uh, here, though, if we choose the chirality in the right way, we can effectively tune between insulating metallic and semiconductor uh, topologically insulating carbon nanotubes. And qualitatively, we can actually find that these simulations agree with our, our simpler SSH model. So undoped structures do, of course, give harmonic generation. Uh, but through doping, we can really drive this much more strongly if we target these plasma resonances. So that's what you can see here uh, in these figures and also in the paper. Please check it out if you're interested. Uh, the summary, the conclusion is, again, what I've said. Uh, we, we want to look at exploiting in, intrinsic optical resonances to enhance the nonlinearity in nanostructured materials. Uh, to have high harmonics on the nanoscale, that would be really great. And the topological states, uh, as you've heard in some of the talks today as well, they're very intriguing in, in this context, and we definitely need to look more into that. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thanks, Joel, for this very nice talk. Are there questions? Uh, I have one. You have the density matrix equation with this stamping term. So how do the results depend on the choice of this stamping? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, and, and they do. So it's, it's, again, kind of a qualitative versus quantitative story. Obviously, uh, if we choose a smaller phenomenological damping, and we're talking about these plasmonic uh, enhancement effects, th they will become much more effective, right? Uh, but, ac but actually, it can also lead to a quicker onset of saturable absorption. So in a way, like, like you see in this figure here with the CW simulations, uh, you can effectively, you're shifting the plasmonic resonance or saturating it when you drive with really intense light. So if I have a lower damping, that field concentration gets even stronger, and it can quickly saturate. Eventually, the of course, in the numerical side, the solver will fail at some point if we take an arbitrarily small damping and a very high intensity. So it kind of sets the threshold intensity for triggering the nonlinearity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. So further questions? I don't see anything in the chat, no raised hands. Okay, so let's thank Joel again. Okay, thank you. And the next speaker is 
Alvaro Jimenez Galan. I hope it's pronounced more or less correctly. Yeah. And we'll talk about light wave topology for strong field electronics, inducing, controlling, and reading the valley pseudo spin on a sub laser cycle time scale. And I think we are right on time. So you may start. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. And thank, thank you very much uh, to the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity uh, to be here uh, with you, especially uh, Dieter. And uh, well, I am uh, Alvaro Jimenez Galan uh, from the Max Born A Institute in Berlin. And uh, this work is uh, co authored, uh, well, uh, special mention to uh, Rui Silva from uh, Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, who you heard, uh, Olga Smirnova, and Mishka Ivanov from the uh, MBI in Berlin. So in this talk, I will show how methods from uh, atom second and strong field physics can be used to uh, tackle current challenges in the field of uh, electronics. Um, so electronic materials are uh, 2D graphene-like structures with uh, broken inversion symmetry, such that a band gap is opened at the K and K prime uh, Dirac points. Uh, this band extrema are the valleys, and we can define a spin-like quantity or pseudo-spin that labels if the electrons are in one valley or uh, the other valley state. And uh, valetronics is a field that searches for the way to initialize, manipulate, and read this valley pseudo-spin to use it as additional information carrier and storage. Uh, the broken inversion symmetry uh, of the systems in combination with their time reversal symmetry gives rise to a non-zero uh, Berry curvature, uh, which is equal but has opposite signs at each of the valleys. Uh, so this is what uh, Rui explained this morning, since uh, we have that the Berry curvature at K equals the minus Berry curvature at minus K. And uh, so here I show the Berry curvature in the first Briyuan zone, in this red dashed line, of the conduction band of hexagonal boron nitride. Now, uh, this very curvature acts like an effective uh, magnetic field, which points out of plane of the monolayer, and in the presence of a longitudinal electric field, uh, it deflects electrons to the left or, uh, or to up or down, uh, depending on uh, its sign. So I show the very curvature in red for positive sign and in blue for uh, negative sign. And this Berry curvature leads to optical valley selection rules. So circularly polarized light will couple to one or the other valley, depending on the helicity of the light and the sign of the Berry curvature at band. Therefore, using resonant circularly polarized light, we can initialize the valley uh, state. Uh, uh, the valley state yeah. Many experimental works have uh, now achieved this. And now the challenge of valetronics is to be able to manipulate this valley state, this valley pseudospin. So to drive electron populations from one valley to the other. And for it to be of practical use, this valley manipulation must be done faster than uh, depolarization, than valley depolarization, which is around one picosecond. And this time scale of control cannot be achieved in the one photon resonant regime that valetronics uh, usually operates in, since this regime requires really long pulses. So one solution to this problem was proposed in 2018 by the group of Rupert Huber, and it consists on locking the timing of the one photon resonant pump to the oscillation of a strong terahertz streaking field. And this requires control of the timing, the frequency, and the intensity of this uh, terahertz field. The question uh, that we pose is if the resonant pump frequency can be eliminated altogether. Now, from previous works from uh, Mark uh, Stockman, we know it's possible to initialize the valley pseudospin with non-resonant circularly polarized pulses. But is it possible to achieve also valley manipulation with non-resonant fields, even in the mid-IR range, and not in the terahertz? So in this way, our laser system uh, since we have, we're using non-resonant fields, is independent on the properties of the material, and the same laser system can be used to control different materials or heterostructures. 
So our method consists on using tailored fields uh, tailored to the symmetry of the lattice. In this way, depending on their orientation, they can address differently the two triangular sublattices of these two D systems. So this uh, uh, threefold pulse is made by the combination of a circularly polarized fundamental field with its counter-rotating uh, second harmonic. And this pulse can be rotated, uh, so from here to here, on a sublaser cycle time scale by only changing the time delay between this omega and two omega pulses. So this pulse was first generated in the 90s, and now it is uh, routinely produced and characterized at many labs. But of course, this is a naive picture because experimentally, you cannot focus the beam on an individual lattice, but we will cover a big part of the crystal. So does this field, as implied by this naive picture, address differently the sublattices in real space? And does this translate to valley selection in case space? Well, we find that it does. So this panel shows a first principle calculations uh, of the electron populations in the first conduction band of hexagonal boronitride after the interaction with the pulse, as would be measured, for example, in uh, RPC. So these are electron populations localized here at the K prime valley and here at the K valley. So time delaying the omega and two omega pulses by half a cycle of the fundamental rotates the threefold pulse from here to here and changes, switches the valley state. And moreover, this result is robust for a wide range of band gap versus frequency ratios. Uh, so from here, from uh, six photons to cover the band gap up to 15, uh, which uh, demonstrates that the same laser system can be used for materials with very different uh, band gaps. And also, uh, here I don't show it, but switching the helicity of the fields, of the omega and two omega fields, but keeping their same uh, orientation of the threefold will not switch the valley state. So it is also robust to slight ellipticities of the drivers. So this valley state will only switch if, the, uh, if we rotate the threefold and address the opposite sublattice. And this can be easily done by, as I said, varying the two color phase delay with no need for individual uh, CEP stabilization. So what is the reason behind this result? Well, uh, we know that during the strong pulse, uh, the band structure and the electron hoppings are modified. And in uh, 1988, Haldane uh, showed that the complex second neighbor hopping breaks time reversal symmetry and lifts the degeneracy between the K and the K prime valleys. This is what Rui was explaining this morning. In absence of external fields, this 2D valetronic materials have time reversal symmetry precisely because this is what you need. You need two degenerate valleys. So the field free second neighbor hopping is real. But in the presence of this tailored field, of this bicircular field, the second neighbor hopping acquires a cycle averaged imaginary component that is proportional to the two color phase delay. So to the orientation of the ball. So this transforms our system on a sublaser cycle time scale into a system similar to the topological model of Haldane. And in principle, this allows, for example, to close the band gap and transform the system into a topological insulator during the pulse. And for valetronics, since tunnel excitation is exponentially sensitive to the band gap, lifting the valley degeneracy will also lead immediately to valley polarization at the uh, valley with the minimum band gap. So by the way, so this is uh, the, yeah, the non-resonant version of flow topological insulator. So the time domain uh, yeah, non-resonant version. So here I show you a movie uh, demonstrating valley manipulation on a few femtosecond time scale. So uh, I'm using three micron pulses for hexagonal boron nitride, which has a band gap of around uh, 6 EV. So on the top, I show the orientation of the field with respect to the lattice. Below, the cycle averaged uh, band structures in the presence of the field. So how these band structures are modified uh, during the field. 
Uh, on the right, I show the electron populations in the first conduction band of hexagonal boron nitride as would be measured, for example, in Arthas. And this movie will show what happens when we change the time delay between the omega and the two omega pulses. So when we rotate this tree. So you see that different time delays makes the uh, field address differently the two sublattices, which lifts the degeneracy in, uh, in the valleys, the band structure, and in turn gives rise to valley polarization. So one half of a cycle later of the fundamental, the valley uh, polarization switches from polarized decay valley to polarized at the K prime valley. And in this case, since we're using three micron uh, lasers, this a switch corresponds to around five femtos. So this shows that strong Taylor fields are able to uh, manipulate the valley pseudospin in a non-material specific way on time scales orders of magnitude shorter than valley uh, depolarization. But to be of practical use, uh, we should not only be able to uh, write and manipulate this valley pseudospin optically, but also to optically read it. And uh, to do so, uh, we will use high harmonic generation following a similar method to that uh, explained by Rui this morning and outlined in this paper here. Uh, so let us take the case uh, in which uh, the two color phase delay of our field excites uh, the same amount of populations at K and K prime. So it addresses more or less equally the two triangular sublattices. So we have the same populations at K and K prime. And after the interaction with this uh, pump by circular pulse, we apply a linearly polarized field polarized in the X direction. So along gamma M here. The dipole current generated by this field will have a component uh, parallel to the field that drives it, but also an orthogonal current due to the anomalous velocity due to the Berry curvature. So since the Berry curvature has opposite signs at K and uh, K prime, uh, the orthogonal current generated at K will flow in an opposite direction to that generated at K prime. And since we have equal populations at K and K prime, these two orthogonal currents will cancel and therefore will lead to linearly polarized harmonics of the, uh, of the probe, of our probe field. When the population of one valley is greater than the other, then these orthogonal currents from K and K prime will not exactly cancel, and the harmonics generated by the linearly polarized probe will be elliptically polarized and with a helicity, which depends on the sign of the Berry curvature of the most populated valley. So when the valley population switches, of course, the helicity of the harmonics will also switch. So therefore, as a function of the time delay between the pulses, we can manipulate the valley state. So the electron population switches from being polarized in one valley here to being polarized in the other valley half a cycle away. So uh, this can be measured all optically using high harmonic generation. So the blue line here is uh, the valley polarization measured from the electron populations. And the gray line here is measured from the helicity or from the ellipticity of the third harmonic uh, of the probe. And uh, in the right panel, I show you a, a, a solution uh, simulations for MOS2, uh, just for the same three micron laser uh, to demonstrate that this valley polarization is possible with the same three micron laser system for two materials with drastically different band gaps. So the band gap of HBN is uh, three times bigger than that of MOS2, and still we can have a great deal of valley uh, polarization. Uh, so do I have two minutes more or? Yes. Okay, so then, then uh, just, so if the bicircular field uh, makes our system uh, turn into a Haldane type model, then the question is, can we induce a topological phase transition with our light? And our analytical model predicts that you can uh, using the right laser parameters. So for increasing field strength or decreasing frequency, uh, the system will undergo a topological phase transition. 
So here I show a movie in which I change the intensity of our driving uh, bicircular field. And the, in this case, uh, the time delay of between the, the pulses is fixed. And I show you the uh, band structures, how the band structure is modified as a function of increasing uh, electric field. And you will see that the band gap will close at around 7.5. Uh, 7 uh, and the very curvature uh, will uh, change sign. This is marking the topological phase transition. So here we see that the band gap is closing. Here the band gap closes and the very curvature has changed sign. So this is the mark of the topological phase transition. But this is analytical. So uh, to test this, we perform numerical experiments in a two band model of uh, HBN. And here I show you the uh, anomalous Hall conductivity, or if you want the effective uh, churn number, the pulse, so as a function of time inside the pulse, uh, for different intensities. And from less intense in uh, cold colors to more intense in hot colors. And the predicted topological phase transition of the model is here given in gray. And we see, and above this threshold, the system is predicted to have changed into a topological insulator. So we can clearly see that the anomalous Hall current changes sign during the field exactly at the predicted topological phase transition, so at the gray uh, line here. So while numerically we cannot tell if the band gap has closed, it shows that we can change the sign of the churn number during the pulse. And uh, we find the same behavior if instead of changing the intensity, we change the frequency. So precisely at the frequency threshold predicted by the model, uh, the system changes this uh, time-dependent uh, churn number. Churn number changes sign during the pulse. So to summarize, I have shown you a new non-resonant scheme for valleytronics, and we are able to write, manipulate, and read the valley pseudo spin in a non-material specific way and on a sub-laser cycle time scale. And this method allows to manipulate the topological properties of graphene-like systems, taking this concept of floquet topological insulators into the uh, few femtosecond uh, regime. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thanks Alvaro for this beautiful talk. Thank you. Are there questions? So I have one. Perhaps I missed it, but your laser frequencies, so omega and two omega is smaller than the band gap, very much smaller than the band gap. Yeah, or? yeah, yes, yes. It's, uh, so the laser frequency, so the band gap was 6 CV, and uh, the free, so it was a three micron laser. So it's, uh, so it's a three micron for the fundamental and uh, 1.5 for the, for the second harmonic. Uh, but then does it, does, so does it make? then does it make sense to speak about the uh, average T2 because... Yeah, the, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this, this is a good point. So, it, it, uh, so we, we are taking... Uh, so we, we are doing a perturbative uh, model of, uh, of the cycle average of this T2. Um, so what we do is break the the hopping into a cycle average term plus contributions which are not cycle averaged and these contributions which are not cycle averaged are treated uh, to second order perturbation theory uh and and we find these corrections uh to t2 uh but this you can do uh so you can do in the non-resonant case yeah so so before it was done for the resonant or above resonant case this was the floquet picture uh, so we have done it for the non-resonant uh, case. Mm -hmm. So are there questions? If you don't, if you don't have a microphone, you may also type the question and I read it. Uh, I have. Can I make a question? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so if if you focus now on the vibration of the lattice, uh, which is typically slower they would see an average effect. Uh, how do you think that uh, this could affect the uh, uh, phonon dynamics? Yeah, but phonon dynamics are usually very, very slow. So, uh, so for the time scales that we are talking about, I don't, think, uh, I don't think they will play a major role. Yes, but they would see an average that would be modified by these you very fast fields. You would see an fields. average. 
Yeah. And it might modify the effective dynamics. Uh, the, 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 the electron dynamic, I mean, you would see, yes, you would see an average, uh, but, but uh, yeah, so maybe they would be a bit displaced. Uh, the atoms. This, this I haven't, uh, I haven't thought about. I mean, we just have the the ground state fixed uh, atom uh, case. We don't have it with a little bit of displacement. If this is, uh, okay. this is what you mean. This we haven't explored. No. Okay. Thank you. So I don't see further questions. So thank you, Alvaro, again. Thanks. And the next speaker is Christoph Jures. Can you share? Yes. First of all, you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. And you can also see my my screen. Yes. All right. So, thank you very much, and for your attendance here, and for the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about my research today to you. My talk is about helicity flip of harmonics from finite and infinite topological algorithms. You might be familiar with the three step model in GAS, so the generation of harmonics in the semi classical model, which is sketched here on the left. We have an electron in the ground state, which is excited into the continuum and moves around in there, and by recombination with the hole in the ground state, by harmonics can be emitted. And there's a very similar model, which you might have heard today, in solids, where we, instead of a ground state, have a valence band. And instead of the continuum, we have a conduction band. But the three steps are similar. So we have the electron, which is excited by the laser pulse, into the conduction band, where it moves around, and the whole, respectively, in valence band. And if they recombine, a high harmonic photon is emitted. A special kind of, of solids are topological insulators. They are related to the Hall effect. And the properties are special because they are insulating in their interior and conducting on their edges. This is related to the Hall effect and is sketched here where these electrons move in these cyclotonic orbits in the center of the material. And hence, there is no current flowing in the interior. But on the edges, these cycles cannot be completed. And hence, half of the orbits are skipped. And therefore, a current flow here on the right is observed. The typical band structure looks as follows for a topological insulator. We have a valence band and the conduction band, which are well separated because it's an insulator. And then and within this Fermi level and between these bands, we have this surface states or edge states, depending on the dimension of the topological insulator. Yeah, the question now arises why it is interesting to look at high harmonics from topological insulators. And there was one work um, here for one dimensional topological insulators where the topological phase B and the trivial phase A show a huge difference in harmonic yield in this area, this gray shaded area here, which presents the below band gap region. So, with high harmonic generation, it might be possible to um, yeah, probe the topological phases of the material in a time resolved way. You also see in this picture here today by Silva and co workers where the Haldane model was um, yeah, investigated. And in this model, the helicity of the emitted photons changes at the point of the topological phase transition, this blue lines here. And this might also be an effect to de uh, this determine the topological phase or even control the helicity in this way. For a two-band system, many things can be calculated analytically, and one will end up with a Levenstein-like formula, similar to the one in the gas phase. If you are interested in this topic, there's a poster today at five by my colleague Daniel Moos. And yeah, if you are interested in that, please go and check this poster out today.
In my talk here, I will concentrate on aldenide nanoribbons. So again, this Haldane model with which you have heard today. We have this ribbon here. So it's not a plane, but just this single ribbon with periodic boundary conditions. And inside one unit cell here, this rectangle, there are four sides. So in the end, there will be four bands. And this is not so easy to calculate analytically anymore. Then you see this filled and unfilled circles, and these correspond to different subletter sites and different onset potentials. So this is not really graphene, but more like hexagonal boron nitride, for example. Then again, to make this topological, you know that we have to include um, complex next nearest neighbor hopping, which is in this the direction of the arrow is T2 times e to the i phi, and the complex conjugate in the opposite direction. The laser field is polarized linearly along the chain. This is here just to sketch how the calculations are done. So we have this time-dependent Hamiltonian, which is coupled to the field via this phase factor here, which is known as the pile substitution. The first term here is the nearest neighbor part. Then we have the next nearest neighbor part and the on-site part. We solve the time-dependent Schrödinger equation and calculate the current. And because the system has two dimensions, the current is, yeah, can be calculated in parallel to the electric field and perpendicular to it. And if we calculate the Fourier transform of this both currents, we end up with this P in both directions. And the absolute value squared of these P's are the spectra in the respective directions. And the phase differences here of these two spectra um, determines the polarization or the helicity of the emitted photons. Before I show the results, let me um, briefly do some kind of analytical stuff here. So with the bulk system, um, so the Bloch, um, with the Bloch ansatz we will end up with this four by four Bloch Hamiltonian here. Note that all the entries are real and yeah, the Hamiltonian is symmetric. So the eigenstates of them in a certain gauge are also completely real. And these are the eigenstates here. So a vector with four entries and we choose the gauge in such a way that the phase at site number one is always zero. This means that this value here, this u1, is always positive. This i here is just the index of the bands, the different eigenvalues or energies. And then we look at the phases here, the phase differences at some certain site between band three and band two, because these are the bands that are important for the spectrum. And they are important because when you look at the band structures, as I said, there are four bands. Band two is this one, and band three is this one, and they are closest to the Fermi energy or the minimal band gap. So these, is, these are the bands that contribute the most to the spectrum. Without Haldane hopping, you see that this is symmetric and there's a small band gap due to the onset potential. And then if you increase it to 0 0.01 roughly, you see that the band gap closes here at one K point. And this is a point where a topological phase transition occurs. Afterwards, the band gap opens up again. Now I said this phase difference are important and they will enter the um, current in the end. And therefore I plot them here. As I said, the eigenstates in this gauge are real. And therefore this phase differences can only be zero or pi. So I plot them here as lines. So if this line is solid, then this means that this phase difference is zero. And for this dotted line, it is pi. Or if you wish to look at the, band, uh, the um, Bloch states itself, this means the Bloch states here at this side, alpha equals one is positive, negative, positive, negative, or better the um, multiplication of both of them corresponding to the bands. And you see at T2 equals zero, 
this is constant over the whole pre one zone and there is no flip here from this phase difference at one certain site. If you then um, increase your next nearest neighbor hopping, at some certain point, at least one of these phase differences flip, and this is shown by this gray area here, which indicates a point where the phase flips the first time around k equals zero. And you see if you increase your t2, this gray shaded area here, where everything is the same as for t2 equals zero, um, increases, decreases, sorry, towards k equals zero here. As I said, these phase differences will enter the current in the end and are important, but let's look at the phases itself because they are more physically to understand, I guess. So if you look at these phases here at band two, you see that in the middle of band two, the first ones, the block states then are positive and the second ones, so at, band, at side three and four are negative. So you can see this as kind of a not rule because we have positive values and then two negative. So in between, there must be a zero point and therefore the state has one not if you wish. Band three, this is positive, negative, negative, positive. So here you have two nots, two zero points in between. So you can see this not rule here of quantum mechanics that if you increase the energy or the band index, the number of nots also increases. But what happens now in this non-shaded area? We see that this is positive, negative, positive, positive. This means here in band two in this non-shaded area are two nodes, whereas in band three, positive, negative, negative, and negative, this is only one knot. If you increase this further, then also in band two, you have a region where it's always positive, so there's no knot at all, and at band three, there's three knots, so this corresponds more like to a band four state. This means that in this non-shaded area, the bands two and three or other bands are inverted. If we now go back to the band structure and plot the same gray shaded area in here, I um, define the energy difference between band two and band three at the point where the bands are inverted as delta E minus and delta E plus, and at K equals zero, just delta E zero. And if you see the energies, energy differences between band two and band three in this non-shaded area are or below delta E plus are always corresponding to this non-shaded area and above delta E minus has to be in this shaded area here, as long as delta E plus is smaller than delta E zero. So this means there's some energy separation between these points in the band structure where the bands are inverted and where they are not. If we now go to the band or the high harmonics finally, we see that in parallel direction, the highest harmonic yield occurs in the region of small harmonic orders and small T2. But there is nothing happening in this or at this energies delta E plus, delta E minus or delta E zero. And the same is true for the perpendicular part of the harmonic spectra. But if we now go to the um, phase difference, we see that something changes around these two lines, delta A plus and delta A minus. So if you fix a T2 and follow this line of the cursor, you see that below delta E plus, so in this region where the bands are inverted, there is one helicity. So the helicity or the phase difference is predominantly pi half, so this is one helicity, and afterwards for energies larger than delta E minus, this is predominantly minus pi half, so here the helicity in between these two energies has flipped, and this is um, explained by this inversion of the bands. In my title I also mentioned finite systems, for now these are just yeah, if you wish, infinite, so with periodic boundary conditions. But now, with 
the system with edges, we see the same effect here that the helicity flips around these two lines, delta A plus and delta E minus, as long as they are smaller than delta E zero. But you also note this other effect here, where the helicities or the ellipticity um, changes at some certain yeah, T2. So if you increase T2 here, you see that at some certain harmonic orders, the helicity also flips. And this is related or very similar to the fact that the um, silver et al has observed, but instead in this picture here or in this system, there's no topological phase transition at this point here. Yeah, just let me summarize. We've seen that in this graphene-like ribbons, there is a helicity flip observed if we fix T2 at some certain harmonic order. We could explain this by the change of the blob phase differences or as you wish at the point where the bands are inverted. The same features are observed for in spectra for periodic systems and the system with edges. And as an outlook, there are some unanswered questions. For example, why we also see this effect that Silva et al did, but at a point where no phase trend or topological phase transition occurs. Yeah, and some other features that will be investigated in the future. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Christoph, for this nice presentation. So are there questions? Uh, can I ask one? Yes, yes. Just really naive. Uh, great talk, by the way. Uh, Thank you. I've just, what's, is there like a simple intuitive reason why you have this uh, broken symmetry in your case space? Is it just this, the way you've chosen the unit cell of your ribbon? Or um, you maybe I missed something deeper. This symmetry here? Yeah, like looking, it's not symmetric across the zero point of k equals zero, right? Yeah, it's because we have a complex T2. So the Hamiltonian but, basically has this T2 and therefore the, um, the symmetry is broken for that. Okay, but it, is it just an arbitrary shifting that comes like as an artifact or is it something real? Do, do you know what I mean? Maybe. I think this is real, this effect that there is broken symmetry because of this complex next nearest neighbor hopping if this would be real so yeah. if this t2 would not have a phase or a phase of um zero or pi then this would still be symmetric like what i mean is could it be restored could you restore the symmetry with some gauge transformation and then you get the same physics at the end or is that not true i guess you would not okay I mean, these calculations are, should be gauge invariant. Yeah. I mean, Christoph even tried different gauges for the coupling to the laser field mm -hmm. in, in his finite system calculations. And we also checked this for the Bloch system with the Bloch ansatz. Yeah, of course. Okay. Can I make a point, please, Dieter? Uh, yes. I, th I think Joel's point was that whether the effect, this was just a mere shift in case. Or, or there was something else, and I think there is something else, right, from what we see in in the other pictures. But you know, you put naively as a phase to the hopping seat, it shifts the case. But um, but you have something else than that, something more than that, right, G Christoph? Yes, yeah, so you mean the shift in case space here in this bench structure, or what are you talking? Uh, yes, whether whether you just restore normal situation by shifting the case or or not okay so that's not possible well, I, I mean i guess it's i guess it's not just a shift right there is an actual asymmetry there right. so if no later is more clear but the beginning yeah. it's uh, less obvious yeah here you really see that there's an asymmetry around k so if you shift this somehow this would not be resolved yeah this would not suddenly be symmetric so I think Alvaro has a question, right? Yeah, 
Um, so in in uh, so regarding this helicity flip, uh, so in uh, our case, well, in, in general, uh, the thing is that uh, the helicity can change, of course, uh, without the topological phase transition, and this depends. Uh, for example, in the trivial case on the sign of the Berry curvature at that point of K, where the where the harmonic is emitted, right? So harmonic 11 will uh, have the helicity of uh, of the sign of the Berry curvature corresponding to the point in the band gap uh, which has this. So um, so I mean I, maybe it's not uh, it's it, so it doesn't have to be a topological phase transition, of course, for the helicity to flip. Uh, so it, it it can be just that that you're uh, at a point there because as as you increase uh, t2, I guess uh, well I, either the the you, the Berry curvature gets more uh, peaked around the your k points or or it gets more dispersed. So so the so the sign of the Berry curvature kind of changes as you as you change the t2, and this can affect the helicity. This is. Uh, I, I don't know if you uh, if this uh, if this could be the reason, uh, but uh, yes, it might yeah. be, but it's complicated to calculate for the systems the Berry curvature because this mm -hmm. is finite. Yeah, yeah, and, but and I, I guess that. yes, it's. It should but be I guess related it, to the band curvature, right? Because and it has to, and it has to be related to the to 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 the to the to the phase of the of the block uh, of the block states uh, that that you have. Yeah. So so it it should be it should be related, I think. But it's it's interesting. So thank you, thank you for that. So, Hossein Iravani has a question. Uh, do you want to ask it yourself, or should I read it? So probably I should read it. So why do you think the existence of edge states couldn't affect the results? Yes, I guess because the physics in this results are related to the bulk and there's still a bulk if we have edges. So yes. Okay, and the last question is by Uri Silva, please. Uh, yeah. Yeah, just a, a small question. Did did you try to to just see uh, these effects in in the extended system, or or try to see if this also happens in the extended system? Um, be, because okay, so so just like Alvaro was saying, we we argue that uh, the, the change in the Berry curvature at k. Uh, Re is it reflects in the change of 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 the helicity, but it's not the only reason for why the the helicity can change. Um, so so did you try to 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 have uh, an extended system instead of a nano ribbon or and and see the results? Yeah, this would be our next step. But I know so extended. You mean extended also in this y direction? Yeah, yeah, just like and Aldine, and, and then yeah. Yeah, so in the end, we should end up with your same results. So that probably the silicity flip as function of the harmonic order should vanish somehow or so in such a way that you couldn't observe them. Okay, 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 thanks. Yeah, thank you, Christoph, again.